Good evening and welcome to the San Bruno City Council meeting of September the 24th, 2019. I'd like to thank the San Bruno Garden Club for their floral arrangement. As we called the meeting to order, may I please have roll call? Councilmember Davis? Here. Councilmember Medina? Here. Councilmember Salazar? Here. Vice Mayor O'Connell? Here. Mayor Medina? Here. Uh, could I ask Lori Greenberg to lead us in the pledge? to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, now we will be moving on to public comment for items not on the agenda. And if, if there's a speaker, thank you. Is there any additional speaker cards? How many speaker cards do we have, please? Twelve, okay. So we have 12 speaker cards. The city clerk will call, call you up and uh, we'll call a couple up at a time so we can keep it rolling. And so if you would begin with the first speaker, it is three minutes. And when the timer is done, you'll, you'll need to end it at that time so we can conduct the business. And it will be three minutes for those 12 speakers. Dr. Sharon Camberg, followed by Stephen Seymour. Good evening, Mayor Medina, Council Members, and City Manager Grogan. I'm Sharon Camberg, recently appointed Interim Superintendent for San Bruno Park School District, for the t and I'll be serving for the 1920 school year. I appreciate the warm welcome I've received already from the community. While I look forward to addressing the Council at a future date with an update from the district, I wanted to share with you this evening how impressed I am with the strong support city agencies have for our students. City departments, including community services, library, police, fire, public works, and recology, are collaborating with the district on wonderful projects to enrich our students' educational experience. Most recently, community services assisted YouTube and the chamber in sponsoring a meet and greet to in introduce me to the commu community. San Bruno Police Association sponsored a weekend at Tamferan where they filled a cop car with, uh, to attract donations of school supplies to help our students. They collected an amazing amount of supplies, boxed them, and delivered them to our schools, including preschool. Recology San Bruno recently reported to the board on the successful partnership our schools enjoy with them around the idea of sustainability. Some months back before I joined the district, the fire department hosted a Saturday workshop for our fifth graders about being a firefighter. Public Works brings the touch a truck activity to our preschools. And throughout the year, city staff volunteer to read to our students. All of this support reflects on the council and the city management who recognize that it does take a village when it comes to nurturing the welfare of youth. I'm deeply impressed with what you do for the children of San Bruno Park, and I look forward to working with you throughout this year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next. Stephen Seymour, followed by Priscilla Paro Suerta. Hello. Um, so I understand that tonight uh, there's a group of folks who are talking about what might be a new project at the crossings. And um, I'd like to see a new project, a hotel there, but I would like to see one that uh, we don't lose, um, one that goes through to fruition. And I think to do that, then we need a commitment to make sure that the hotel workers that are there are paid fair labor. And so I'm here tonight with one job should be enough in local two to uh, ask that when you choose a developer, you choose a developer that will make sure and that it's our city practice that when we build a hotel on that site, that we build a hotel where the owner of the hotel and the city will support fair labor and fair wages. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Next speaker, please. Priscilla Paro Suerta, followed by Raymond. Hi, my name is Priscilla Paro Suerta, and I've worked at SFO for eight years. I'm proud to be a Local 2 member and a resident of San Mateo County. In 2016, I was part of a group of 
union workers who walked the, ci the city of San Bruno and collected 3,246 signatures to make sure that we didn't get that hotel built in San Bruno. We need, we need a hotel, but we also need good jobs in San Bruno that provide a manageable workload, a living wage, and affordable health care. This is a chance for you, the city council, to do the right thing. When you make big development decisions for San Bruno, you should involve the residents. We want open, affirmative outreach for city council meetings, not special meetings or closed door sessions. Um, when this comes on the agenda, we will be back to address our concerns and issues with you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next. Ramen followed by Satya. Good evening, everybody. My name is Ramen Chan, and I work at the San Francisco Airport Marriott Waterfront. Been there for 11 years. I work as a houseman, and um, I would like to ask you guys that, uh, um, and I'm a pr proud a union member and um, a resident of San Bruno. We need good jobs in San Bruno that provides a manageable workload, a living wage, and affordable health care. Tell the developers that the community of San Bruno cares about good jobs and that San Bruno is different from other cities. Maybe in other places, developers can build hotels without agreeing to treat workers respectfully, but in San Bruno, that is not good enough. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Satya, followed by Mark Wise. Hi, everyone. I'm Satya. Work for San Francisco Waterfront Marriott for 20 years. And I'm proud to be a union member now and the resident of San Bruno, of San Mateo County. We need good jobs in San Bruno and provide <coughs> a management workload, living wages, and affordable health care. This is a chance for you, the city council, to do the right thing now. <coughs> when you make a big development decision for San Bruno, you should involve the residents. We want open, permittive outreach for city council meetings, not special meetings and closed door sessions. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Wise, followed by Julio Cuevas. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Mark Wise. I am a resident of San Bruno. Uh, I've been here for 12 years, and I am also a member of Local 2. I've been with Local 2 for over 20 years. Um, I currently work at Intercontinental Hotel in San Francisco. Been there since they opened, and um, uh, I'm a proud member of Local 2. Um, Local 2 has given me um, a place to work where uh, it's given me a good job, and a good job to me is, is affordable health care. Um, it gives me a wage that I can, that I can be proud of. Um, the workload is reasonable, um, and and if I have any complaints, you know I have people I can go to um, that that will back me. Um, what I'm asking for, just like everybody else, is we just want to be a part of this decision. We want to know what's going on. Um, when it comes down to uh, you guys picking a, a developer, um, let the people of San Bruno know what's going on, and and let us be a part of that. Um, it would be nice for. Uh, local residents to uh, to be able to work at um, a union establishment inside the city and not having to drive to San Francisco or, or further out. So uh, keep us in tune and, and let's get this put on the agenda and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next please. Julio Cuevas followed by Jose Guzman. Good evening, Council. Um, my name is Julio Cuevas. I live right here in the Shelter Creek. And, um, what I want to say tonight is it's very important to take the right decision because San Bruno is a city that many people prefer to live here. For example, I 
moved for six months out of the city and I come back to live here because I feel it's safe there. And I feel also that uh, everything is grown in one, in one level. And I think you have to take that kind of decision, good decisions, because when everything is moving in the same level, something like employees or citizen, they have to be in, um, have to take one of the good advantage also of the city, like things here is a little more expensive, uh, it's more uh, uh, free to walk, to, to the park, to, I mean, it's more safe than many other places. So I think it's good if you take the right decision because people that is growing like me, I would like to go to study. I, I would like to, to study. I would like to, to keep uh, growing myself. But if I live in another place, I don't going to have probably the same chance that I have over here. So if everybody grow in the same level, it would be very for everybody, also for the, for the city of San Bruno. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Jose Guzman, followed by Secontino Ramos. And Jose will be giving his remarks in Spanish, uh, as will Secontino, um, and I will be translating them into English. Thank you. Hola, buenas tardes. Uh, mi nombre es Secontino. Trabajo en el W Hotel por 17 años. He sido un miembro por 18 años desde la Unión. Soy residente de San Bruno. Necesitamos buenos trabajos que ofrezcan buenos salarios, razonable salario digno, eh, un precio bajo de seguro. Eh, sería todo. Gracias. Hello, I'm Secundino Ramos, and I have worked at the W Hotel for 17 years, and I've been a union member for 18 years, uh, and I'm a resident of San Bruno. We need good jobs that offer reasonable workload. We want a good salary, and we want health care that we can afford. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Secundino Ramos, followed by Emily Wendler. Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Emily Windler. I live in Silver Creek, and I work in ASAPO for nine years. And I'm very proud to be a member of Local 2. And uh, City Council need to listen to the residents when we say we need a good job in San Bruno, and we need more property level job we want real meaningful outreach and commun communication from the city of council in San Bruno. Resident of development, Del City Council member do right thing and ensure that if a hotel is developing, if a crossing of include of promise of a good job. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. M Molly Gomez. Hi, my name is Molly Gomez, and I've worked at SFO for over 40 years in various restaurants. And I'm proud to be a union member and a resident of the Bay Area. We, of course, need good jobs in San Bruno that provide a manageable workload, a living wage, and affordable health care. This is a chance for you, the City Council, to do the right thing now. When you make big development decisions for San Bruno, you should involve the residents. We want open, affirmative outreach for City Council meetings. No more closed, behind-the-door, secretive meetings. Furthermore, I was a member of the San Bruno Committee for Economic Justice. And I'm hoping that this time around that you guys will do the right thing. The right thing is to, you know, you should be proud to be San Bruno. You have good land. You have a chance to have a good developer. And just put, put it out there ahead of, ahead of the bid. And let them know that this is a, a worthwhile city and you're give, don't give away the farm. Don't let them have all these concessions. 
you have a right to have a, a good hotel built and, and good workers. So do the right thing this time around, please. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speaker cards? Okay. With that, we're going to move on to announcements and presentations, and we have quite a few. I'm going to ask uh, Joanne if she would be as so kind uh, to read our first two items, items A and B under the announcements, please. Good evening. Community Services Department has several upcoming special events. The last concert at the Rotary Pavilion in San Bruno Park will be on Friday, September 27th, 2019 at 6 p.m. The concert will be followed by the family overnight in the park showing the free movie, Ralph Breaks the Internet. For more information about these events, please visit the City of San Bruno calendar at www.sanbruno.ca.gov backslash calendar. In addition, the Friends of the San Bruno Library will hold their semi-annual book sale on Saturday, October 5th, 2019 from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. in the library's downstairs community room. Thousands of books will be available for sale. Bring your own bag and fill it with books for just $7. All proceeds benefit the library. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is item C, which is the League of Women Voters will host a candidates forum right here at the San Bruno Senior Center on Tuesday, October the 1st from 7 to 9 p.m. Item D, present proclamation declaring October the 6th to the 12th as National Fire Prevention Week in the city of San Bruno. There's a lot of whereases, but we have young people here who have no, no need to get to do homework tonight, so we will uh, abbreviate this and let our chief talk. But um, the 2019 Fire Prevention Week theme is not every hero wears a cape. Plan and practice your escape. Effectively serves to remind us that we need to take personal steps to increase our safety from fire. Now, therefore, I, Rico E. Medina, Mayor of the City of San Bruno, do hereby proclaim the week of October the 6th through the 12th as Fire Prevention Week. And I'll bring this over to the Chief. members of the council and so you didn't get tongue tied on that but I probably will so this year's theme is not all heroes wear capes so plan your escape and that's where I'm encouraging you all, all residents to do this year is get home with your family talk about what you would do in the in the event of a, a fire plan that escape and practice it when that smoke detector goes off what are you going to do and that's also the theme for our 66th annual fire poster award contest so all the elementary schools got a poster delivered, I think, last week. Uh, we picked all those posters up. We'll be judging those posters. Um, students were asked to do, in fact, that plan, their escape theme, and actually practice it with their family and, and give us the date and the time and sign, verify that you did practice that plan. We'll be hosting, or actually, we'll be going to the schools during Fire Prevention Week to do assemblies so that we can uh, give out those awards and also present um, fire information, prevention information to the students. We have some information on how to do that plan as well that we'll be passing out to all of our elementary school students. Uh, additionally, we will be hosting our annual open house on Saturday, October 12th from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Station 51. We invite all the residents to come by, visit with your firefighters, learn about uh, fire prevention, some emergency preparedness. We'll do some demos. We'll do store tours of the station and you can get a hot dog and a hamburger and probably something cold to drink. So we welcome everybody to come by on the 12th. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. Uh, with everyone's uh, permission, I'd like to go ahead and go down to skip E for right now, go to F to receive the presentation from the 2019 San Bruno Sister City Exchange delegation on their visit to Narita, Japan that occurred uh, in July of this year. And of course, as we said, they're, they're here and they're folks, and so I think it would be nice if we go ahead and let, let you and them sure. make their presentation. Sure. Uh, Javon Grogan, City Manager. Uh, let me just say that it was my pleasure to attend Narita this year, uh, which is the 29th year of San Bruno's sister city relationship with Narita. And so I was the delegate for the uh, city of San Bruno, and I uh, was able to accompany uh, 10 lovely kids from Parkside Middle School and two teachers 
uh, Danielle Quinn and, and James Stewart. Uh, and here tonight we have uh, Principal Smith that will uh, lead the presentation, but next year will be the 30th anniversary of our sister city relationship. They're really looking forward to having um, members of the city council attend. It is an amazing, amazing, amazing opportunity, uh, not just for uh, members of the city council and staff, uh, but it is an amazing cultural exchange uh, between the city of San Bruno and the city of Narita. I'm sure uh, Parkside will tell you all about it, uh, but they're an airport city. Uh, uh, we're near a major airport. We have so much in common, and there were many times that, uh, albeit a, a dominant culture difference, but you could sort of close your eyes and you're, you're in the U.S., and we have so much in common. Uh, it was also my pleasure uh, to host uh, a number of uh, four delegates from Narita that came to the city of San Bruno early uh, in 2019. And so it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity where they come here and we go there each year. Uh, and uh, next year will be 30 years, so uh, we're hoping to continue it uh, even better and stronger. So with that, I'll introduce Principal Smith. Right. Thank you, Mr. Grogan. Uh, Mayor Medina, members of the council, and City Manager Grogan, good evening and thanks for having us. I'm Don Smith, I'm the principal of Parkside Intermediate School. And I would like to introduce, uh, as you met earlier, our interim superintendent, Dr. Sharon Camberg, our board president, Terry Chavez, uh, two of our dedicated teachers who oversaw the, uh, pr the Narita program, Mr. James Stewart, Ms. Danielle Quinn, one of a few. And they were the advisors who worked with our students on the Sister City Exchange put in a lot of hours um, outside of their classroom, outside of their duties as a, as a teacher to make sure this happened. Thanks for the opportunity this evening for Parkside students to share their experiences from their summer exchange visit in Narita. Special thanks to city manager Javon Grogan, Joanne Magrini, and Daniel Brewer in community services, and, and the San Bruno Community Foundation for their support of the Narita exchange. Since 1990, hundreds of students from Parkside Intermediate School have benefited from San Bruno's sister city relationship with Narita Japan. Each year, students and educational leaders from Narita visit our city and they visit Parkside as well. In turn, a delegation from Parkside in the city visit Narita. Parkside and Narita students have enjoyed the cultural exchange while establishing friendships that transcend the thousands of miles separating them. The mission of sister city relationships is to promote peace through mutual respect, understanding, and cooperation. One individual, one community at a time. These are the tenets of Parkside's philosophy that our students will embrace diversity and become better positive contributors to our society. You will now hear from several who benefited from this once in a lifetime experience. That, that's your cue. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, you guys can go, go over to the podium. That's great. Uh, hi, my name is Jared Salazar. Um, Uh, my experience in Japan was amazing. We did a lot of good uh, cultural um, events in which we bonded with um, our delegates. <coughs> we visited uh, m many major places in Narita, such as um, Nuts and uh, one of the museums. Um, we also visited uh, City Hall many times and we got to uh, see uh, a lot of the stuff that happened. Um, we got to, uh, we got to uh, experience one of the annual events in Narita 
in which they pulled a, a shrine from one of the temples to City Hall and back. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so um, before I start, I'd like to say um, thank you to um, all the chaperones uh, and all the people who were involved with this program as they made like huge sacrifices for this and for my benefit and for everybody else's benefit. And I had like, so to start off, my experience in Narita was really fun and I will never forget it. And it, Narita has like really rich culture and through this program, they really immersed me into this culture by just, they, our week was action packed. They, we, oh no, uh, we were taken to so many different places, like two temples, a muse like many different museums. And it's just, we had a lot of fun. And the people in Narita are really nice. They were willing to give us everything. We, uh, whatever we asked them, they would give it to us. And we had to limit ourselves. We had to like, be careful that they wouldn't give us, like, be careful what we would say. Otherwise, they would just give us something super expensive, and we didn't want them to do that. Because <laughs> we want their wallet to stay full. <laughs> and and one of the, my favorite activities was especially the Gion Festival, which uh, which I thought we were just going to pull the huge shrine thing called the Dashi around the temple, but it turns out it was um, across the city and uh, up hills and stuff. And it was, I had tons of fun and I was so dead tired after it. It's a massive shrine. And um, and especially my partner here was had so our host family offered to take us to a restaurant, and he was so tired he basically slept the entire day the next day. And so and my host family was incredibly nice. The parents, w or at least the moms, were incredibly were had an incredible skill in cooking. Like, when we went to a restaurant, uh, th they said we would eat at home, but, and after like the first few days of them cooking for us, I would be excited for eating at home, because they could cook whatever. And I had, and they gave me, so they showered me with gifts. Um, I had problems packing. And yeah, uh, I really enjoyed this program. I hope this program continues. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tegan Brooks, and I'm one of the Narita de delegates. The first thing I noticed about Narita was how clean and beautiful the city was. I liked visiting the school and taking the art class there. I also loved visiting the Dijonji Temple and making the rice cake. I liked getting to meet the new people, such as my delegate and her siblings. The people in Narita are very happy and kind. This program is a good experience because it teaches you a lot about other cultures. You make new friends and learn about their home lives compared to the life in America. I hope this program to c continues for my brother Bryce so that he could have the same wonderful experience as I had. Thank you. Um, before I start, I would like to thank anyone and everyone who was involved in helping create this program because I had an amazing experience in Narita. Um, I am one of the 10 delegates that went to Narita in July, yeah. and um, it was incredible. Narita itself is a, such an interesting city with amazing people and history, and I was astounded by the kindness and um, creativity in all of the people that I met and I enjoyed all of the places we went such as the festival where we got to pull the dashi 
and the school where we got to, where I was introduced to kendo for the first time. And so I hope this program continues because it gave me such an amazing ex cultural experience. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Santiago Moreno and I want to tell you about my amazing experience that I had in Narita, Japan. So on the first day, we went to a Edo period r town and it was so amazing because I felt like I just traveled back in time to the Edo period and I just learned all this new information. And that's thanks to our tour guide who was just like an encyclopedia full of information. After that, we went to uh, go show off our dance to uh, our delegates. We really worked hard on the dance and it really paid off. Uh, but I feel like the best thing about that day was going to eat with the, our host family because they showed us around Japan and I felt really welcome when they uh, took us around because they gave us like a personal tour and I felt really touched. Uh, on the next day we went to uh, Daijon Temple. Uh, it was really amazing seeing all those beautiful statues and everything. I really learned a lot about Buddhism through uh, meditation and activities. And then after, after that, we went to uh, Nihong Automobile College, Nats. There, uh, we uh, were showed the process of making cars, which was really cool and really detailed. But the best part about that college, they let us ride in the cars, and it was super fun. <laughs> the, uh, but the next day would be the most exhausting. The reason was we had to pull a giant shrine uh, to, to City uh, Hall. I was not ready for that. <laughs> it was super heavy. Uphill, downhill. We were so happy when it rained. <laughs> uh, but, so I come back from the uh, pulling the shrine. And then we go back, and then we pull it again, me and my partner Jesus, for over an hour and a half. We don't know when it's gonna end. <laughs> it, we feel like, we're, it, like it's a mental test or something, but it was super fun because I realized that the, the whole Narita community got together to, to celebrate as one community. And, that, and that's what I want San Bruno to be, like the Posey Parade, but last till like 12 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, the next two days we spent with our host families. So me and my uh, partner Jesus, we went to a place called Akihabara, which was super fun. There was so many activities to do. And our, I could tell our delegates were tired but they wanted to show us around. So I really appreciated that. Uh, the next day after that, we went to Tokyo Tower and went to go see all the stuff that Tokyo had to offer. It was super, it was really big and intimidating, but it was really fun. Because inside there's a little amusement park. We spent three hours in there. It was, really fun but the next day I feel like that was really seeing uh, uh, Japanese culture because we went to their uh, a junior high school where we got to interact with kids our own age eat with them laugh with them and talk about life with them and I felt like well the world is really big while I'm sleeping someone's going to school getting ready, and doing homework, and I, my mind was blown. Uh, but after, after, uh, <coughs> oh, 
uh, after that, uh, we had to leave. It was the saddest part of the trip, honestly. I felt like I was leaving, leaving a part of myself in Japan. But with leaving myself, I also brought back a knowledge and culture back with me so I can share with my family and with the San Bruno community. I think we should continue this relationship to educate more, more Parkside students about Japanese culture and life. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jesus Meza. Uh, the Narita Exchange Program was a mem uh, memorable and fascinating experience where we got to spend time with two people across the world in Japan. The two delegates uh, my partner and I hosted were uh, Kosuke and Yusuke, who both like to play uh, sports and video games. They first visited San Bruno and stayed at my house, and for the next couple of days, we bonded doing activities such as going to the beach, walking across San Francisco, and even watching a uh, Giants game. We also uh, shared common interests such as video games and liking hamburgers. In July, we made the trip to visit them in Japan and see their lifestyle. Both of the families were very welcoming and even invited us to play uh, family games such as cards. We also got to meet the delegates' friends who were welcoming too and talked to us about the trip and what we liked about Japan. We went to temples, uh, arcades, a uh, school, and even a maid cafe. Not only were the people kind and respectful, but they always made sure we were comfortable and talked to us about our experience. I would recommend this trip to any eighth grader who had the opportunity, as, as it's not only fascinating, but helps build friendships where you wouldn't expect. Hi, my name is Lana Feldman, and I'm one of the delegates who visited Japan this July. Um, it was a really great experience. Um, I met lots of different people. The, their families were amazing. They're so welcoming and so kind all the time. Um, we did m many different activities, like visit temples, pull a shrine. Um, we went to Tokyo Disneyland, Tokyo Sky Tree. Um, uh, went to a few museums, and it was really great. It was a really fun experience, and I learned a lot about their culture, which was really interesting. Um, we. It was also really great food all the time. <laughs> um, so I recommend this trip to anyone in Parkside or, yeah, anyone in Parkside because it was really great learning about their culture and meeting these two amazing families and spending their time with them and just being in Japan. It was a really great experience. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jasmine Huerta, and uh, I am really thankful that I got to get this experience uh, because I got to make new friends with a great family, with my both of the families, and um, I got to try new things I never had before, like octopus. Um, uh, I also went to the world's largest statue and got to stand in its chest. It was so cool. Um, and then I also went to a place in Tokyo where it had an indoor amusement park with a roller coaster inside. Um, I would definitely recommend this to everyone I meet because it's such a great experience. Um, and I definitely would want to go back again. And I also want my sister to enjoy this experience too for when, if she goes to Narita. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, I just want to say I learned so much about each and every one of the Parkside kids. Um, and it was an amazing opportunity for me being the, a new city manager, getting to know a whole different facet of the community. Uh, and so thank you for those eight days we shared uh, and all of the gifts we brought back. Um, I, I doled them out to members of the city council. Um, but I want the city of San Bruno to know that we took over five suitcases of gifts um, 
to pass out uh, to various people, uh, and people are walking around Narita now with uh, San Bruno chains, San Bruno uh, note, notepads, and special gifts from us. Uh, and it's just an amazing experience, an amazing cultural exchange, and I, I can't tell you how many times we said there is more that unites us than divides us, and we have to continue programs like this. Mm -hmm. We have to uh, have opportunities for our kids to be exposed to another culture. Um, and this program comes at a great cost. Uh, one of the things that I'm excited about is that we were able to purchase the tickets early this year to cut down on some of the cost. Uh, and we are constantly working for additional funding, and we can't let this night go by without thanking the San Bruno Community Foundation that stepped up for the second year to uh, give this program a grant. And the grant application is due tomorrow, and we will be applying again for a third year funding to support this very valued program, uh, in addition to the money that the city council uh, allocates each year, because uh, uh, the city of San Bruno covers the hotel bill. Um, and it, it's, it's our commitment to the schools, um, and it's our commitment to uh, our youth. And, and thank you for everything you, uh, you do. So uh, first and foremost, to, to the students, who went and represented San Bruno in your school, uh, and you did, all did a great job. I will tell you um, your idea of having the Posey Parade go till midnight, um, or the community day in the park, the police chief may have something to say, but, but we can always look into that. Um, but to the teachers and, and the principal, um, I think this is a program, obviously, that is reaching its 30th year. And I can remember being back in Parks and Recreation when used to, one of my jobs was to help facilitate uh, that as the current Parks and Recreation Department does. And it was very memorable, something that I've always uh, enjoyed. And I think back to Bob Marshall Sr., uh, our former uh, elected mayor, uh, who is very instrumental in, in really believing and supporting this program. And it has lasted these 29 years. And it's a real dedication and commitment that everyone gives at all levels, from the educators to the school district, the school board, the city, the community foundation, parents, parents of course, parents, uh, and your commitments uh, hosting when the students come here. So uh, on behalf of the council, um, all of you did a great job. Thank you for getting up to the mic. Uh, thank you for representing San Bruno. And if we had our way, we would tell you, you don't have to go to school tomorrow and no homework. <laughs> but that probably won't go over well. Uh, <laughs> so, but anyway, I want to thank you for your presentation and thank you for uh, representing San Bruno in your school so well as you did uh, in Narita, Japan. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so everyone, please, you're dismissed. <laughs> please feel free. I know you've got other things to deal with and homework. We're going to go ahead and now move to uh, back to item E, and that is to receive the annual presentation from, this, uh, the, from the Senior Citizen Advisory Board. And we'll just wait just a sec. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Dorothy Carmichael, and I am the chairperson for the Senior Citizens Advisory Board. And I will be presenting our 2019 annual report this evening. The mission of the board is to provide input and make recommendations for implementation of education, recreation, literacy, artistic, and social activities for citizens age 50 and over to contribute to their quality of life. The board receives monthly reports of programs and lunch participation, senior center attendance, and information and referral requests. There are seven voting members on the Senior Ad Set Citizens Advisory Board, five at large and one representative from AARP and one representative from the Nutrition Site Council. The members are Dorothy Carmichael, myself, Herb Chu, Bunny Epperson, 
Bill Goff, Flory Green, Barbara Luzayich, and Joanne Tracy. The board's treasurer is Karen Hornan. This year, we, we welcomed over 70,000 visitors to the center. This is an increase of over 4,000 visitors from last year. It's one of the most popular senior centers on the peninsula, and it's hard to find parking. <laughs> <laughs> the kitchen served almost 26,000 nutrition, nutritious meals. This is an increase of over 3,000 from last year. As you are aware, the lunch program is co-sponsored by San Mateo County through the Area Agency on Aging Grant Program, which provides partial funding as well as resources for nutritional education. This past year, we provided information and referrals for over 240 seniors. Requests are usually related to insurance, food sources, legal referral, social services, health, and housing. Our transportation program transported over 2,600 seniors from their homes to the center this year. The, this program is also co-sponsored by the San Mateo County Area Agency on Aging Grant. The total class and activities attendance this year was almost 60,000 people. Some of the most popular offerings include bingo, bocce ball, zumba, line dancing, hiking, and exercise classes. The fastest growing activity at the moment is mahjong. The center provides the tile sets and groups of four find a table and play daily. And they find a table wherever they could locate one. <laughs> Over 140 seniors volunteered this year to help make the senior center vibrant and successful. Volunteers assist staff with the lunch program, the welcome desk, off-site trips, bingo, and the sports programs. Without these volunteers, the Senior Center would not be able to provide the many programs and services that are currently offered. The Nonprofit Nutrition Site Council continues to support the Senior Center with the annual monetary donation as well as sponsoring the daily entertainment and off-site trips, some off-site trips. They continue to run bingo each week in the popular coffee bar. Funding for the Senior Center comes from four sources. Cities General Fund, donations from the Nutrition Site Council, the County AAA Grant, and the Senior Citizens Advisory Board Trust Fund. This year we accomplished a few large projects. The synthetic bocce ball court received annual maintenance during that maintenance, the park staff rebuilt the side rails for better performance. The Kitchen Island Butcher Block countertop was replaced with a stainless steel countertop. This will provide a more durable surface as well as a surface that is easier to keep sanitary. The kitchen range was replaced with a new range after approximately 30 years of use. It was replaced with the same make and model as before, with a few upgrades. A, few, a new food service coordinator was hired. After extensive recruitment, Fabiola Cruz was hired for this position. She has 20 years of food experience. She is acclimating to the Senior Center culture incredibly well and has already served a few of her, few of her incredible recipes. So far, one of the favorites has been her homemade tomato soup paired with a tuna sandwich. And I actually experienced that, and it was very good. We are very excited to have her as a part of our team. Some of the other accomplishments this year include working with the Cappuccino Interact and Leadership Clubs for intergenerational activities, holding a memorial bocce ball tournament in honor of longtime volunteer Ken Kreisel provided an emergency preparedness event with 168 people in attendance, celebrated the center's 32nd anniversary, coordinated Age Well Drive Safe Seminar, offered performances and demonstrations during the lunch program, and held the annual volunteer recognition lunch to thank the volunteers. Some of the upcoming goals for the, the goals for the upcoming year 
include offering a spouse partner law support, introducing new musical performances into the daily lunch program, working with the facilities division to implement the ADA transition plan, first year projects, working with public works to restrike the parking lot, I can't wait for that, and construct a new trash <coughs> enclosure. And then I had a, a personal note to address to you. I came to the Senior Center in 1994. That's 25 years ago. I've been coming to the Senior Center, I can't believe it. After being downsized from my job as an accounts receivable supervisor at Zellerback in South San Francisco. I started with the walking program, thinking I was so fit, but the 70 years, year olds proved me wrong, and I thought I would have to be carried back. It was scary when I started my new life, and I didn't think I would know anyone, but I felt welcomed here and started to make friends. I attended, I attended a computer club class and became involved in the, their newsletter for five years and also held office. My husband, who had Parkinson's disease, enjoyed playing bocce ball. There were only four seniors playing at the time, and now there are three leagues each week. 18 years ago, I started escorting day trips. I learned to play bridge, and that has opened a whole new world to me. Four years ago, I learned to play Pedro and enjoy that at least twice a week. I don't have time for the marjan. <laughs> I can't fit it into my life. I could go on and on, but feel that this center is not a place to come to after you retire to sit back and let people wait on you, but a place where we come to feel alive, learn, and serve. Volunteering is hard work and sacrificial, but I'm sure we all have more stories to tell as to the benefits we have received in giving back to our community. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Any questions from council? Or comment, Laura? Dorothy, that was an excellent presentation. Thank you so much for your dedication and, and your volunteer. And there's a lot of volunteers that make this, this uh, program successful, and I wish you much more success. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, uh, to echo what Laura said, A, thank you to the, you and the board, and please convey that to the rest that aren't here this evening. Um, but also, thank you for uh, ending with your uh, story of when you arrived back in 1994 here, 25 years ago, and how it's evolved and, and developed. And I think when the Senior Center opened, one of its trademarks was that it was going to be kind of oversaw a little bit by its elected body, uh, the Senior Advisory Board, and it was really going to be ran by the volunteers uh, that really make it their second home. And that's really what I think gives it the, the passion and, and the love and that's why, uh, as we still look around this building that was opened back in 1987, it still um, it is well kept and maintained because of all those that come through here and want to make sure that their second home is just like their first. So thank you for all that you do and that you give back. And uh, as you know, the Senior Advisory Board and their funds help also offset some of the costs that go to the day-to-day -day, um, things that you see and the improvements that happen. So this is truly um, an organization and a center that continues to give. So thank you on behalf of the council, and uh, we wish you the best. Uh, and uh, please pass on our, our thanks. Let's move on to consent, please. All items on the consent calendar are considered routine or implement an earlier council action and may be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion unless requested. Any items uh, that need to be pulled for a separate vote or some of you may have a comment? Uh, Through the chair? Yeah, Michael. Uh, a member of the public asked if we could uh, have a little discussion on 5E uh, prior to the vote. Uh, e is just as far as an update or as far as a separate vote? Uh, we, I don't believe we need a separate just vote, but little just more a, a little more. Uh, okay, right. some info. Got it. Is there anything else from the council? Okay, if not, why don't we go ahead on item E? And uh, Michael, you had brought that yes. up about the resolution authorizing the receipt and expenditure right. of 81000 right. from the California Office of Traffic Safety pursuant. Mm -hmm. I'll stop there. All right. <laughs> yeah, so, so no, I, think, I think this is a very uh, important grant that we, uh, we apply for and, and receive uh, regularly. And 
I just wanted to uh, offer um, the, the chief an opportunity to talk a little bit about the benefits of this grant and um, let the public know what we're doing. Good evening. Uh, thank you. Yes, this is an annual grant that the police department applies for, um, obviously, every year. We've been fairly suc successful over the last couple of years. Um, the vast majority of these grant funds are dedicated towards um, traffic safety, uh, primarily uh, DUI um, enforcement, pedestrian safety, and general um, uh, traffic enforcement. So it allows us to um, put more personnel um, out on the street to conduct dedicated traffic enforcement in what we consider or we identify as hot spots throughout the city. Now I know everybody watching at home and, and folks here that they all have their own personal hot spots and, and we get those that feedback on a, on a daily basis. But we do have an algorithm at the police department where we we take traffic data based on um, the sites that we issue. Uh, collisions that, that happen in certain areas of the city and complaints that we receive um, year-round. We punch those into the, the formula that we use um, and we, we create a targeted traffic enforcement program um, that allows us to um, be a little bit more efficient rather than just going out there blindly um, uh, enforcing traffic and, and it al allows us to work within our means um, a little bit more effectively. So the funds we receive from the state, it's actually uh, the state is a um, fiduciary for the federal government. The, the grant in initiates at uh, the federal level at the, na uh, the National Highway tra uh, Traffic Safety um, so Authority or NHTSA. Um, and they pass it through the state's Office of Traffic Safety and we're the benefactors of that. So last year we received about $76,000. This year we were fortunate enough to receive about $81,000. And, and those are the programs that we, we focus on with these funds. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, no questions, Chief, but uh, thank you for taking the time to seek out and apply for these grants and uh, for making good use of, uh, of those resources. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Chief. And with that, I will uh, make a motion to approve the consent items in their entirety. Second. Motion made and second to approve all consent. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? I hear 5-0 voiced uh, for approval. Public hearing. Item 6A, hold public hearing, adopt a resolution adjusting the affordable housing impact fees for residential and non-residential development projects. Hi. So, uh, Javon Grogan, city manager, uh, th through the mayor and council. I want to introduce Keith DiMartini, the city's finance director, who will give a presentation. Uh, as the city council knows and the public knows, affordable housing is a uh, significant issue, not just in San Bruno, uh, but uh, within the Bay Area region and, and uh, almost uh, all urbanized parts of, of California. And so the city of San Bruno, uh, adopted affordable housing impact fees in 2016, and we're here tonight uh, to talk about indexing those fees uh, to go up 4.82%. Uh, uh, Finance Director Keith DiMartini will go through all of the salient points and the analysis that the city did uh, to get to that and uh, what will be the impact on each type of development, be it residential, commercial, retail, office, or hotel. Thank you very much. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. My name is Keith DiMartini. I'm the City's Finance Director. It's my pleasure this evening to provide you with an overview of the City's affordable housing um, fee program and our request to Council to index the fees to adjust them um, accordingly. The objective of the hearing tonight uh, is to hold a public hearing and request Council to adopt a resolution adjusting the affordable housing impact fees for residential and non-residential development projects. The agenda for the presentation is to provide you with a brief background and legal authority of the affordable housing impact fee program. I'll provide you a listing of what the current fees are by project type and what the proposed fees are, are being requested based on the indexing. And then I'll discuss the next steps that must occur um, if council is to adopt uh, the resolution uh, with the request to council, and then I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. And I will say that in preparation for this meeting uh, tonight, staff uh, did email um, developers that currently do have applications submitted with the Community and Economic Development Department, um, as well as uh, multiple representatives from the Building Industry Association to inform them of the request before council this evening. And we conducted a similar outreach uh, to the development community um, when we brought the Comprehensive Development Impact Fee Program to Council a number of months ago. 
So let me just provide a brief overview of the fee and the imposition of it. Uh, development, uh, the fee is assessed for development, um, for a development project where the developer does not provide uh, on or off-site affordable housing units within the project. So if they choose to not provide those units as part of the project, then they will be assessed um, a fee. The fee will be imposed on them. The affordable housing impact fee is assessed on both residential and commercial projects. For residential, that includes single family projects, condominiums, and apartment projects. And for commercial development projects, that includes office, retail, and hotel projects. This fee program is very consistent with, with most cities, um, I would say a majority of cities in San Mateo County and across the state. This is a very, very common uh, impact fee that is, assess is assessed on development projects. Um, when a developer chooses to not provide those units on or off-site and they pay the fee, the city receives that payment from the developer. We deposit that into the city's in lieu fund. And the current balance in that fund, um, as of the date of the staff report, um, is a, approximately $3.8 million. As the city manager mentioned, the affordable housing impact fee was first established on December 13th of 2016. <clears throat> It is a major component of the city's hou the housing element. As I mentioned, it applies to residential ownership, rental, and commercial projects. And for residential projects, uh, it, it's applicable for a project with five or more net new units. And the calculation methodology that staff use is assessing the fee per square foot of net new gross floor area. And so what that means is if a project plans to demolish some square footage of an existing um, property and replace it with additional square footage, the fee is assessed on the additional square footage component. The municipal code uh, where council first adopted this program, it does allow the city council to consider a resolution to adjust the affordable housing impact fees from time to time. And according to the engineering news record, construction cost index of San Francisco, which is the indice um, defined in the resolution that was originally adopted, uh, the rate increase from 2016 to 2017 was 2.74%. And the rate increase from 2017 to 2018 was 2.02%. And so the cumulative increase from 2016 to 2018 is 4.82%. So that is um, the methodology that staff used that is before you this evening uh, requesting your approval. And then going forward, um, staff will plan to bring back to council on an annual basis uh, an indexing request for not only the in lieu fees for affordable housing, but also um, all of the development impact fees um, that council adopted a few months ago. Um, as part of the annual budget process. And so that will be a process that will be coordinated through the budget process to request indexing of, the, of all of the um, development impact fees. <clears throat> this slide here shows a table listing the six unit types defined in the affordable housing fee program. And it lists first what, their current, what the current fees are per square foot. Uh, so for a single family project, you'll see that it's a $27 per square foot assessment. And then the next column lists what the adjusted fees are proposed to be after the indexing uh, is to occur. And so for a single family project, the fee will increase from $27 per square foot to $28.30 per square foot, which is an increase of $1.30. So that's how this table is shown. And it's important to note um, that the fees will be applicable for all development projects that are currently in the, in the development pipeline where a building permit has not been issued and the fee has not yet been paid. Um, the current development pipeline does suggest that the city could receive several million dollars in affordable housing impact fees in the upcoming five uh, fiscal years in the current economic cycle. These amounts 
may vary wi uh, widely over time based on the, the actual level of development that, that will occur. And so we'll just, we'll have to see um, what development comes in to see what impact it will have on this fee program. So if council is to approve, uh, to adopt the resolution this evening, the fees would take effect 60 days from today, and they would take effect on November 25th, 2019. And as with any fee change that, I that is to occur, the city will update its master fee schedule, which is posted on the city's website. And so with that, uh, staff's request to council this evening is to hold a public hearing and request council to adopt a resolution adjusting the affordable housing impact fees for residential and non-residential development projects. That concludes my presentation. Be happy to answer qu any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you for the report. Uh, this is a public hearing and we do have a speaker card. So at this time we'll open the public hearing for input. Alexander Melendrez. Good evening, City Council. Uh, first off, I just wanna apologize for my attire. This is not normally how I would come to a City Council meeting. Um, my name is Alex Melendrez. I'm a resident of San Bruno and I am speaking only for myself in this capacity. Uh, I wanna echo the comments made by our economic director. I'm sorry, Keith, I forgot your title. Um, the finance director. Finance director, thank you very much. Uh, I can only speak in generality, generalities here. So impact fees are uh, consistent uh, are consistent with what most Bay Area cities are doing for affordable housing. Uh, impact fees are in, and in lieu fees uh, are a good thing. They are needed and a useful tool for uh, the development of affordable housing, especially for standalone offsite and affordable housing that's built through land dedication, excuse me, land dedication. Uh, and they usually, those developments provide a higher uh, quantity and deeper uh, income targeting or deeper affordable units uh, resulting from those impact fees from developments built from those impact and lieu fees. Um, and while all housing is needed, um, both affordable housing and market rate housing, uh, affordable housing uh, for um, uh, uh, developments that have uh, income under 80% AMI are really are really what's missing. And it's not just unique to San Bruno, unfortunately, it's missing across most cities in the Bay Area and the peninsula, where those deeper levels of extremely low, very low, uh, and low affordable uh, housing units are uh, just not being built. Um, again, speaking for myself, um, uh, impact fees are a good thing. And I should have said this for number three, but uh, a Today's uh, National Voter Registration Day. Check your <laughs> voter registration status. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Is there anybody else from the public who wanted to speak on this? Because once we close public hearing, that will be it, and we'll be moving it back to the council. Seeing no one else, can I have an action to close public hearing? Through the chair, seeing no other speakers, I will move that we close the public hearing. Second. Motion made and second to close public hearing. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Okay, now we'll move it back to the council for um, questions, comments? No? Laura. I have just a simple question. Um, is the increase the actual, what, 4.82%? Is that what, is that why these numbers are kind of off? Or an increase of $1.21 versus $1.25, some sort of rounded up number? Is that because it's a 4.82% increase? Or how, how did you get to each of these numbers? Like, sure. So if you, if you, uh, if you were to, so the, inc the increase is 4.82%. So if you multiplied 25 times uh, 104.82, it would equal the adjusted fee. So okay. that's the pure dollar amount increase on the right-hand side. And, and is it also very common to see the single family um, cost be the most expensive? Yes, uh, typically. Uh, and to pr provide a little context for that, um, at a per square foot cost, let's say at an average um, uh, 2,500 square foot house, what we're talking about a total fee uh, of $70,000 at the uh, new level, uh, which is uh, $28.30. Uh, 
uh, the prior level at $27, it was uh, $67,000. And so we're going from $67,500 to uh, $70,750. So, you know, it may look like a, a dollar and 30 cent increase per square foot, but when you're talking about a 2,500 square foot house, it adds up and, and will contribute significant funds to the uh, to the uh, the city's affordable housing trust fund. And that answers my third question. And then the final question is just so just a clarification again. If it was a remodel and you are tearing down and building the same square footage, it's only on the additional square footage of a single family home that you would need to worry about and pay those fees. So, okay. Thank you very much. Good presentation. Good. Good morning, anything? Okay, uh, being no other questions or comments from council, uh, this is a request uh, by the director resolution. for a resolution. Motion to approve the resolution. Second. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Medina? Aye. Council Member Salazar? Aye. Vice Mayor O'Connell? Aye. Mayor Medina? Aye. Motion carries. Now we'll move on to conduct of business. Item 7A. Authorize modifications to the Florida Avenue Park Master Plan. Marty? <clears throat> Since I live um, within a thousand feet of this uh, park, I am required to recuse myself, so I'll be departing. Okay. Uh, through the mayor uh, and the city council member, again, Javon Grogan, city manager. Uh, I want to introduce Joanne McGreeny, the city's community services director that will give tonight's presentation. Uh, this presentation is about Florida Park, uh, a, a new park uh, that will be added to our network, a planning for which begun uh, with the site acquisition in 2014. Uh, and so it's been um, five, five years in, in the making right now. Actually, the city acquired the site October 28th, 2014. So in just a couple of weeks, it will be five years since we acquired the site. Uh, and it is currently sitting, sitting barren uh, with only two uh, heritage trees on site. And Joanne, uh, through her presentation, will talk a lot about the process that the city undertook uh, really beginning in late uh, 2018 uh, up until now. Um, with regard to the two heritage trees. Uh, but there has been uh, a, a long time getting here. Uh, one of the things I'll say is that we're all excited um, for to be at the point we're here today and we had a, a community meeting out there and uh, some of the kids were in strollers. And, and so uh, a number of people universally said, you know, I wanna see a park here uh, by the time these kids are walking around. Uh, and so we're all excited to uh, have made progress. And so with, with that, I'll turn it over to Joanne for the presentation. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Joanne McGreeny, Community Services Director, and I will pre be presenting this item tonight regarding modifications to the Florida Avenue Park Master Plan. The presentation objectives tonight are to provide an update with results of the Heritage Tree Appeal process from November 2018, highlight key settlement terms reached by the City and the appellants, and discuss modifications to the Florida Avenue Park master plan. It's a tongue tire, so I'm sorry if I get tripped up on it. Here is the agenda for tonight's presentation. We'll be briefly review the background leading up to the appeal, as well as review the current park design. We will update you on the Heritage Tree Appeal and efforts between the city and the appellants to come to a resolution to avoid litigation. We will review key settlement terms of the agreement with the city and the appellants. And finally, the recommended modifications to finalize design drawings for the park master plan. Just to briefly review, the project site is located in the Hart neighborhood and runs along the streets of Martin Place, Taylor, San Anselmo Avenue North, and Florida Avenue. The City Council approved the purchase of 324 Florida Avenue in late 2014 for future use as a neighborhood park. On May 24, 2016, the City Council authorized a contract for remediation of the site. This included the demolition of the buildings on the site, as well as a removal and disposal of contaminated soil and asbestos associated with the property, grading of the site, and temporary fencing. 
The site is approximately one half acre in total land area. This depicts the master plan for the park that was approved by the city council on October 20th, 2016. The master plan included elements that were envisioned by the residents, including pedestrian paths, an adult exercise area, children's play equipment, a great lawn, as well as many new trees. Some additional background about what has happened since the park master plan approval. Staff attempted to resolve the challenges that existed with the current design of the park. In reviewing the plan, the two heritage trees seen here, the pine on the left and the cedar on the right, came into consideration for removal. In mid-2018, amongst staffing changes at the city, two independent arborists were contacted to investigate several topics regarding the heritage trees in the current park design. This graphic helps to better depict the location of the two heritage trees that are part of the current park design and their location to the play equipment and pedestrian paths. The green highlighted circle on the left is the cedar and the one on the top of the page is the pine. I was able to la label those late into the game, sorry. There were several concerns that staff had in regard to keeping the heritage trees in the current park design. Staff were concerned about safety risks, risks with the pine and its close proximity to the children's play equipment. The tree produces two to three pound seed pods, also referred to as cones, which could fall from 20, or I'm sorry, which could fall from 50 to 80 feet, potentially causing serious harm or death. This tree species is also prone to mealy bug insects that excrete a large volume of honeydew. The honeydew is a very sick, sticky residue that could cause damage to landscape structures and play equipment. In addition, the tree drops pine needles that would require enhanced landscape maintenance. And finally, during construction of the new park, there was likely to have, it, there, it, there is likely to be impact to the tree root structures, ultimately affecting the overall health of these mature trees. The arborists concluded that construction and use of the park would impact the trees, which would result in diminished health over the next several years. Both arborists determined that although the form of the cedar tree was poor and permanently disfigured, it did not present a hazard. In the evaluation of the pine tree, both arborists indicated that there would be significant safety risks as well as maintenance costs, making it unsuitable for retention. Both of these based on these findings, it was staff's recommendation to remove the trees. This information was presented to the Park and Recreation Commission at the September meeting in 2018 and the commission concurred with staff's recommendation to remove both of the trees. Following the Park and Rec Commission meeting, staff posted the trees for removal on September 20th, 2018, in accordance with Municipal Code Section 8.25.020, which requires a 10-day noticing period. It is important to note here that according to the Muni Code, the requirements for replanting would be two 24-inch box trees or one 36-inch box tree. On September 26, 2018, three ap appeals were received by city staff, one by the city clerk's office, one by the city manager, and one by the community services director. All three appeals included the same information and were submitted by the same group of 18 citizens. The appeal hearing was initially scheduled for October 23, 2018, and then was rescheduled to 23 sorry, was rescheduled to November 13th, 2018 at the request of one of the listed appellants. At the city council meeting on November 13th, city staff made a presentation focused on the removal of the two heritage trees, citing the reports prepared by the two independent arborists. The appellants made a presentation stating that the two trees were healthy and the public safety risk was overstated or could be mitigated. The City Council then deliberated and ultimately a motion was made and seconded to deny the appeal and uphold staff's recommendation to remove both trees and passed on a 4-0 vote. Following the City Council's denial of the appeal, the attorney representing the appellants stated that they would sue the city based on alleged violations of CEQA if the trees were removed. To avoid a potentially costly and lengthy, de lengthy delay, City staff met with the appellants to discuss whether the matter could be resolved. Those meetings were scheduled for December 19th, 2018 and January 11th, 2019.
City staff worked over the next several months with landscape architects to provide sketches that would depict fencing off the dangerous pine tree and reducing the great lawn area of the park. On March 30th, 2019, City hosted a community event at the park location where staff made a presentation and obtained input from residents regarding the alternatives. The, un the alternatives include removing both existing trees, removing the pine and retaining the cedar, or keeping both trees, adding a fence around the pine and reducing the lawn area. 64 attendees participated in a dot sticker exercise on poster boards. You can see the boards in the lower picture on this slide. They used the dot stickers to choose their preferred alternative in the park. More than half, more than half chose the alternative that removed both of the existing trees. Staff also provided residents the opportunity to fill out a feedback form, one per household, providing the same alternatives. 40 residents filled out the forms and over half chose the alternative to remove both the existing trees. During the community gathering, a member of the public asked, if the pine were removed, could the city plant a large majestic tree in its place? Staff did some research and obtained information from nurseries about whether a mature native tree, such as a coast live oak, could be purchased and for what cost. The photograph here was provided by one of the nurseries of what a mature native tree might look like. On May the 2nd, 2019, staff met again with the appellants to explore this idea, which was favorably received. During the next several months of discussions, the city and appellants reached a settlement. On September the 10th, 2019, the City Council met in closed session to discuss a settlement and approved the following key terms on September 18th, 2019. The City will remove the pine and retain the cedar. The City will replace the pine tree by planting a mature coast live oak to be approximately 20 to 25 feet high and about 18 feet in breadth at the cost of approximately $20,000. The city will consider a revised plan that includes the oak in the place of the pine or in another suitable location within the park after consultation with the appellants. The city also agreed to pay the appellants attorney fees in the amount of $15,000. The appellants have withdrawn the appeal and released the city from all related claims. This sketch of the park highlights in red circles the two heritage trees. The red circle at the bottom of the sketch designates the cedar's location where it is to remain. The red circle to the left of the sketch is the current location of the pine. The location of the coast live oak will be contingent upon future design approval. As a result of the appeal and to prepare for potential litigation, the city commissioned several entities to analyze the park site. In addition to the two arborist reports that were provided prior to the appeal being filed, a historic resources impact analysis was done by Page and Turnbull. Their report determined that the proposed project was found to not have any impacts on the historic resources. And the finding applies whether the, whether the park includes or does not include the heritage trees. A biological study was also performed by WRA to address site conditions. Their report documented the habitat conditions and the very limited potential for special status species to be present at the site. Here is a summary of the costs expended by the city to mitigate potential city liability and resolve the threat of litigation, estimated to nearly $76,000. Due to the delay in construction of the park, there will likely be added expenses associated with cost escalation. City staff are exploring additional funding sources to support the increased costs. The proposed action is that the City Council authorize modifications to Florida Avenue Park Master Plan and approve it by motion. The revised design retains all previously approved features. It removes the pine and replaces it with a mature coast live oak. The modifications to the master, sorry, the modifications to the park master plan is in compliance with CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act. If the city council approves the re revised conceptual design, staff will prepare detailed drawings consistent with the approved design suitable for bidding. The drawings will be presented to the city council for approval by resolution at a later date. The anticipated date 
for completed drawings would be the first quarter of 2020 with a formal construction bid process to occur thereafter. Construction of the park could begin as early as mid-2020. The recommendation is that the City Council authorize modifications to the Florida Avenue Park Master Plan as proposed by staff. Staff will return to City Council for approval of the finalized Park Master Plan with, with, a final, design, with final design drawings and cost estimate, estimates, which are projected to take two to three months. This concludes my presentation. I'm ha happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for the report. Is there, um, City Manager, anything else at this point? No. no well, oh, ma'am. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have public comment. Look, look, yeah. Uh, so uh, that concludes our, uh, the staff presentation. We're, we're happy to answer any questions. Um, it, it certainly is a lot of money. Uh, I just would like to thank uh, Joanne McGreeny uh, and City Attorney Mark Zaffirano uh, that sort of worked tirelessly on this effort uh, to ensure that at the end of the day, the neighborhood got a park uh, and we had to incur a significant cost to um, uh, make sure uh, that um, we were clearly not in any violation of CEQA, which we um, uh, had a, a really good indication that we weren't, but under threat of litigation, uh, we, we had to produce these reports uh, and, hand, and do the negotiations to really prove that fact out. And so I'm glad that we went through the process. I'm glad that uh, we are proceeding, um, albeit uh, delayed, but, but, but we are proceeding. So. And now, uh, if there's questions or comments from the audience, you can go ahead and go to the podium. Hi. And uh, and then you have you have a speaker card too. Sorry. I don't have a speaker. No, no, no. Oh, I, okay. I just it, it's my mistake. So I just had somebody cut in front of somebody else. So I apologize. That's <laughs> my error. Had some questions about the tree because it sounds like what was could, done could, is traded uh, in a hundred foot tree. Ma'am, oh, could you yes. speak into the mic into so the they mic. can hear okay. you at home? Thank this you. is my first time at a meeting like this. No problem. Um, I wanted to ask about the tree. Um, it said, sounded like it would be up to 20 feet tall. Is that about right? Does it have any measurement about, usually a mature tree is measured at 54 feet, 54 inches above the trunk in diameter. Do we have any idea about that? Because it's just, it's hard to say if the- No, if you the, can just go ahead and ask all your questions and then we'll oh, go okay. ahead so and, there's and that. once you concluded. Yeah, and it sounded like it was about 20% of the height of the current tree. And um, I just wanted to verify if that was correct as well, because it just seems kind of like a, I know I want children to have a park, I would like my nephew to have a park, but there's also people who are elderly in the community on whom this doesn't sit well because they don't get to sit and see the tree um, and enjoy something that provides a lot of joy to them that way. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much. And then um, we had a, a speaker, go ahead. Alexander Melendres. Up here again. <laughs> uh, hello, council and city staff. Again, Alex Melendrez. Uh, I am on the San Bruno Parks and Recreations Commission. However, I am only uh, speaking for myself and not the commission. Um, I was on the uh, parks uh, subcommittee for this uh, proposal along with uh, <laughs> uh, then Commissioner Salazar, now Councilman Salazar. Uh, Council Member Davis was also on the commission at the time. Uh, Commissioner Greenberg also on the commission still. Um, and I also, oh, I should say I want to thank uh, Director McGreeny and City Attorney uh, Zaffirano for their tireless work on this. Um, I attended uh, both of the community meetings. Uh, I was at, uh, I read all the reports, all that information. And uh, there were a lot of coveted requests, the great lawn, the exercise equipment, the play equipment. Uh, the community really wanted a usable multi-use park. Uh, but the, the number one thing I heard during that entire process was that the community, excuse me, that the park would be delivered in a uh, timely fashion and that it would be built in a timely fashion. Um, and with all those desires, desires and multi-use, a, a beautiful park was built, or a beautiful proposal was uh, brought forth for the park. However, uh, I was disappointed to see that several community members chose to delay the proposal with litigation. I feel that uh, hurt the spirit of what the, a majority of what the community members who also attended the meetings, who gave the public comment, who attended the com uh, commission, 
uh, mentioned was their number one desire, which was to reiterate to live at the park in a timely fashion with those uh, multi-use uh, uh, facilities. Um, I, with the majority of the commission, voted to remove the, par uh, remove the two trees, knowing uh, that that was the desire and that there would be nearly two dozen trees that would be uh, in replacement uh, of the uh, two existing trees. Um, I, I'm not happy that the process took this long, and I, I, I definitely understand it was a, a, you know, outside control, and I want to thank the city staff and the city council for their work in trying to move the park forward. Um, but in order to meet that uh, timely desire, I would just like to reiterate, uh, let's move forward with the current plans and proposals with the uh, with Florida Park. Let's get built. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so can somebody reply to uh, the question that we had, please? The tree is a 108-inch box tree. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we'll bring it back to uh, City Council for questions and our comments or? Okay. I'll go first. Thank um, you, Laura. As a former Park and Rec Commissioner, thank you, um, Council Member. I mean, oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner. Um, this, is, this has been a frustrating project and um, you know, it was exciting to get involved with the residents and see their excitement about building a park and really for the kids. Um, it's been an eyesore in the neighborhood for a long time. Um, if I remember hearing correctly in the report, it was 2014 that it got approved by city council and here we are five years later in 2019 and we're only talking about approval and moving forward. It's not even a built park. Um, this is one of those things as a council person you really don't enjoy doing because we sit here and we make the best decisions for the community. Um, I think in the end, really to sum up kind of what had happened was the trees, the two trees that are existing there um, weren't originally gonna be torn down because um, the plans didn't include that and getting out to the property under construction and starting to measure and figure out things. It's like, oh, we've got trees are in the way. Um, one of the pictures showed really good a visual of the pine cones that drop and, and the things that look like uh, ca um, cantaloupe, grapefruits, and then the long um, pine, pine cones. I don't want that above a playground where my kids would be playing that are in the two to three year old playground. Um, we just, we knew that, that it was not the right thing to do, that that tree needed to be cut down. And the other tree, um, it, you know, wasn't a sightly tree as well, um, that, that we can build a beautiful park, add a, brand new trees, and two years down the road really look back at this park and, and admire it. Um, I'm currently at a, a new construction site in San Mateo and we built um, new trees, it'll be two years this November, and I sit, I sit in my office and I look out the windows and it, the trees are beautiful. Um, they are well established and it's, it hasn't even been two, two long years. Um, you know, this project has cost in the city a ton of money. Um, it, it actually has been very painful to go through the process, to listen um, to city staff, to listen to our attorney. Um, you know, what is costing us? The delay in the construction, right? I mean, there's a cost and in, in we're gonna go back out and bid this project. I don't even know what that cost is. Um, we know that there's a $75,000 cost we've incurred to this date. Um, so I say to those, those um, residents who tried to appeal this decision, was it really the best decision for the community? And, and now, you know, we're up in the, probably in the $100,000 that we're taking away from a funding that they can go back to the, the community, um, that can make that park um, maybe even better or another area in, in the town that we can give that money to. Um, at the end of the day, the comments I continue to hear is we want a park built. Um, when are we gonna get this park built? And I'm, I'm sorry and I, and I wish that it didn't go down this process and I wish we didn't have to spend this money. This has never been a choice or decision that we had any, any, any control over, but I think that the city staff did the best they t can do to come up with something that, they, that both parties would agree to and in the end get our park. So thank you um, to everybody involved in the process. I know it's not just one person. So to Joanne and to our city attorney and our city manager, thank you so much. To the chair, uh, I, I think Laura stated it very, uh, very well. I, I share a lot of her um, 
frustration with uh, how this played out. Uh, we were both on the Park and Rec Commission when both this project and the um, Glenview Park uh, came through. Uh, they both came through at the same time. We approved them both there at the same time. And uh, as Laura and I uh, were elected to the council, we were able to be at the groundbreaking for that other park. And yet this park sat um, sort of uh, just idling, um, waiting for uh, some sort of resolution. And it, to me, it really doesn't feel like there were really any winners in this whole uh, whole situation. Um, people have been asking about where the park is, and we haven't had an answer for them until now. And um, really, I mean, we, we had an opportunity to design and build a park that was going to be uh, an asset to that neighborhood. Um, and while some trees would have been removed, um, other trees um, were definitely going to replace it. More trees uh, were going to be there, brand new trees, trees that were planned. Um, and uh, trees that could be uh, carefully maintained. Now we're going to um, be stuck with at least one tree that we know has some maintenance issues going forward. So that's going to be an added expense uh, to maintain that tree. So um, I see it as a, as a subpar solution, but uh, I am glad to see that it is finally going to move forward. Um, I, I made this comment before, and I'll repeat it, that it is very sad that uh, these trees caused so much division in our community and that it became such a, a, a point of contention uh, between neighbors in that area. I, I think everybody wanted the park, and it would have been nice if um, after the community meetings that Alex and I both sat in, uh, we, we thought we had all the issues addressed, and, and I remember that one of the biggest uh, things was about whether dogs should be in there or not. And um, we, we worked past those issues and, and, you know, what should be in the park, and uh, that these, uh, these poor trees uh, ended up being such a, a point of contention is, is really um, disheartening. But I am uh, glad to see that we are going to be able to move forward, and um, I also appreciate all of staff's efforts in, uh, in getting us to this point. Uh, yes, hold on a sec. Thank you. So uh, both Laura and Michael expressed it very well. It's been an extremely frustrating time. I was the council person before. Were you on in the, oh yes, yeah, you were. I so I was the one that persuaded the council that this would be a fabulous thing to do, to buy that, um, not abandoned, but vacant, long time vacant house. I used to walk by there when I was a kid coming to San Bruno pool to go swimming and that place was empty then. And it's been empty, for, it had been empty for a long, long time. And I always thought this would make a great place for a park for the kids around there that I knew when I was growing up. So it's been a long time. You think it was frustrating for us. It was a long time a dream of mine. And finally it the city was able to purchase the land and we got the plan started. We did the community work and the input that we um, try to do all the time. And it kind of fell apart because some people had a different view. You heard from the community workshop that we did at the site that over half the people that attended that workshop and then another over half of the people who um, put in their survey, wanted both trees removed. So here's a case of, of over 60 people wanting something to happen. We're stopped with a lawsuit that's costing the city over $75,000 on the surface, and it's going to cost us probably another, I can't even imagine, another $100,000 because of the construction delay. So it's frustrating. Um, I do, too, thank staff for hanging in there. I know it can be tedious and time consuming and it takes you away from your other things that we all expect you to do, but you did a fabulous job. So we're at least here and we can proceed. I hope we can proceed as fast as possible. Originally bef in, before the city council, no, just after I should say the city council approved uh, purchasing the land, we um, then Mayor Ruane and I were walking down the sidewalk and um, a family man came down with his kid in the stroller and he was so excited that his his child would be able to play there and now that kid's almost six years old so 
Um, let's hope we can get it there and done before he turns 10. So thank you. And um, if, with that, did you want to make a statement? Yeah, I, I'm going to chime in, and I think we're all kind of sharing the same uh, frustration that it took much longer than it should have. Um, you know, when I sat on this council and we uh, voted to uh, purchase that lot, I'm uh, being very candid because it's obviously public record, I was the one who voted no. And it was for the concern of using all the park and move fees that we had. It was the concern of the ongoing maintenance and having the staffing and all of those little nu nuances that, that occur. Um, I was asked by Mayor Wayne then to be on the subcommittee with the vice mayor. And I said, geez, Jim, why would you ask me when in essence I was the one who d didn't even support the park? And he says, well, you know, you used to do that parks and rec thing. And so maybe you might know some things and can help with the community um, when we had the, the meetings. And so my commitment was then was we'll make that the best subcommittee and the best park possible then. Uh, that's our task. That's what the majority of the council uh, decided was a 3-2 vote back then. And um, so that's what we've done. It is unfortunate that the delay that has occurred, um, and in essence, we probably are back to somewhere where we were that could have already been there long ago. Um, I would say it is already over $100,000 if we talk about staff time, um, definitely, because that's not articulated here. And when we're going to talk about the escalation of construction costs, that's even going to be even higher. So. Um, I think one thing said is it's sad that this park is going to be and was supposed to be a point of celebration and a neighborhood having something in its backyard that they've wanted for a long time and to have that home that had sat there. And back in my days as a kid, I thought it was haunted. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was kind of the, the neat thing to go see. But um, at this point, um, we are here and staff has worked hard, and the councils had to go through this to protect the city, but as well as to move the project forward. We've made a commitment to this community, and we've made a commitment to that neighborhood uh, to have a new park, and that's something the city has not done in a long time. So with that, we will keep our word to those neighbors and to the community of the commitment that we made to them back in 2014, and I think it's time for us to move this forward and start digging. So with that, is there, uh, I take it a motion and a second would be acceptable? Motion on to approve. Second. Staff recommendation. There's been a motion and second to authorize the modifications to the Florida Avenue Park Master Plan. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We have a 4-0 approval to move forward. Yeah. And Mr. Medina, if you would come and join us. Then we have to leave. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to item number eight, which is the study session. Uh, and item 8A, receive report on the San Mateo Avenue conceptual streetscape plan and provide direction to city staff. Okay, and with this we have uh, a couple of recusals, um, but at this time also as they recuse themselves, I'd like to offer them that opportunity to say any remarks that they may want uh, as far as comments from council members because they will not be returning. Well, I'm sorry. I, I, I can return. I'm going to stay in. Listen oh, okay. I'm there. sorry. So, I, I thought um, you were saying. No, I'm sorry. I, I'm going to go back out and uh, wait in the lobby. So yes, I live within a thousand feet of our downtown, and I will have to recuse myself from um, this discussion. Okay. And Irene. thank you. And I own property within a thousand feet of the downtown, and I will also have to recuse myself. Um, but before I do that, I'd like to thank the people who volunteered for Coastal Cleanup, which we did, we uh, event we held on Saturday. I know San Bruno does not have a coast, but we certainly need cleaning up in different areas. So we had over 70 volunteers. It was fabulous. They went out and they cleaned up um, the areas around Huntington and San Bruno Avenue and around the train tracks, or not the tracks themselves, around the train station and uh, parking lots behind San Mateo Avenue. And they cleaned up and brought back over 500 pounds of garbage. Um, they also filled up one of the really big blue toters with recycling so and another blue toter full of composting. So we, we did a good job. So uh, if you 
want to join us next year, it's always the third Saturday in September. So thank you all the people who volunteered and thanks for the Beautification Task Force members who helped set up and monitored everything and weighed the trash and all that stuff. So thank you and I'm gonna go home and watch it on TV. Okay. So with that, uh, it's going to be left to the three of us to enter into the study session and um, city manager, you're gonna begin sure. us? Uh, so you'll have two presentations tonight uh, with regard to the streetscape. This is a study session, no final uh, or formal action is requested of council. Uh, we are here to present the conceptual plan and receive uh, council feedback on that plan. Uh, the first presenta presentation will be from Darcy Smith, the city's community and economic development director. The second presentation will be from the consultant, um, uh, Jacob Tobias. And uh, this effort began in January of 2019. Uh, we came to the city council with an allocation request of 125,000 to undertake this effort to re-envision uh, and provide some additional uh, safety, uh, pedestrian safety along uh, downtown. And it's a, it, it's a product that uh, we really want your rich feedback and that's wh why we're here tonight. The plan will come back before the city council tentatively on October 22nd based on your feedback to, uh, tonight. And so that will be the action night. T today is just feedback. And so with that, I'll turn it to Darcy. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Darcy Smith. I'm the Community and Economic Development Director, and I'll be making a brief staff presentation to introduce this item. And then, as the City Manager said, turn it over to our consultant who's in the audience to help us. So the agenda for tonight's presentation, we'll start with the objective for tonight's study session. I wanted to give you some background on the streetscape plan since it first came to you in January. And I want to update you on why we're doing this. And I'll cover the community and city engagement meetings that have been held to, di to date because there was some extensive community engagement, some of which you participated in. The majority of the presentation will be the consultant's presentation, but um, I'll just touch on some feedback from the Planning Commission that was given to us recently. And I want to emphasize that while I'm making the presentation tonight with the consultant, this was a really collaborative city effort with significant input from the Public Works Department as this plan governs the public right-of-way and ultimately would be implemented by the Public Works Department through um, an implementation project. We have the project planner in the audience from the Community Economic Development Department, Rusha Donde, who's here tonight, who's been working and um, instrumental on the, being the project planner and project manager for the city. And we have Pamela Wu, who's the city's new planning and housing manager, who is also um, leading up this effort with Ms. Donde. The objective tonight, this is a study session, so we won't be taking any action, but we would like you to receive our report and provide st feedback to staff, and we will take that feedback back, and the hope is to get the plan back before you for formal adoption in, in October. So I'll briefly cover a few slides on the background. The 2009 general plan was really sort of the instrumental document for laying forth the policy need for the streetscape plan. Big surprise, it's 10 years later and we're just getting around to implementation, but we, um, we put this forth as a priority. The downtown area really is the symbolic heart of the city. I think most people would agree it really needs some TLC. It really needs some improvements. And with any masterful improvements, um, you really need to start with a plan. And so even going back as far as the general plan, there was a need for improving the appearance of the downtown expanding the streetscape amenities. There's both a safety benefit as well as a sustainability benefit, but really this is sort of an economic development tool. Um, the, the transit quarter plan, which is, was also an economic revitalization plan, also um, called for revitalization of the downtown as well as the Caltrain area and our bus corridors on El Camino Real. So that vision for the downtown is laid out in both of these cities' long-range planning documents is to improve the downtown, um, mention things that you'll hear about tonight, like gateways, improved signage, 
pedestrian-oriented or, or sustainable streets, as you heard about recently with the green infrastructure plan. Those are really important today. And this was actually a short-term strategy of the transit quarter plan, ideally envisioned to be achieved within about one to three years. So we're a few years behind, but the real important need for this plan was driven by economic revitalization and that desire to really enhance the downtown to spur economic investment in it. So as I mentioned, the general plan lays out the vision for the city's downtown and it mentions many of the things that you'll hear about tonight, the expanded streetscape amenities, the beautification, improving the crosswalks so they're really clearly marked and appropriately placed, upgrading the overall kind of physical appearance of the downtown street. And I want to emphasize that this was a collaborative effort with merchants, with business owners, and with property owners. And I'll mention that in the community engagement summary section. But the goal is to create really a destination where residents and visitors want to come and feel safe and feel like it's a pleasant environment. So what is a streetscape plan? You have it before you tonight. We put copies um, up before you so you can look through the, what the ultimate planning document would, would be, will be. But it articulates essentially the vision of what the street wants to be. Um, think of all the great successful downtowns on the peninsula and they all start with a plan. Um, there has to be a significant investment in the downtown um, and that's paid, through, paid for through either public infrastructure but typically private development also is typically engaged in implementing this plan. So it really creates this comprehensive plan and vision creates a sense of identity, sort of like what is it, what, how we want the downtown to look and feel, and that's articulated through a combined planning document. Um, this is really the foundation for future decisions. So without this, we'd bring projects forward or ask for funding for specific things, but you wouldn't have sort of this coordinated approach that will help you as the city council make decisions about future investment in the downtown. And as I mentioned, private developers will also be required to implement this plan um, when they come forward with development projects. We've already been working with that. For example, the new mixed-use building at 406 San Mateo Avenue um, was going through the process during construction to finalize their tree selection. And as part of this draft plan, we were able to, to change the original tree selection to a much more attractive tree, which has been planted there. Um, we're having conversations with other developers in the downtown to try to get some improvements um, to implement this for a quick win. And the city also th thinks we can get some quick wins out of this, um, such as wayfinding signage for the parking lots, which was called for in the downtown parking management plan, which you, were, you adopted in January, and other sort of easier to implement things on a, on a quick basis, like new trash cans, new trees, um, things we do sort of more normally such as crosswalk paving and so on. So the goal here again is to create this consistent streetscape, have a cohesive identity, improve things that are really important to a city's functional um, abilities like lighting, signage, um, and more attractive sidewalks. And I think if you think about all those streets you kind of enjoy walking down, it's because they have a pleasant environment. There's beautification of it, there's good lighting, good signage. This is sort of where I try to all wrap it up into one successful plan that lays out how we'll accomplish that. So as the city manager mentioned, the city council authorized the consultant services agreement with our consultant, Wallace, Robert, and Todd, or WRT in January, and that's really what kicked off the process. The preparation of what's before you tonight took about eight months, and the planning commission reviewed that draft plan in August. But there were many steps that went into it. First major step was analytical, looked at feasibility of different options. Um, we examined things that have been sort of tossed around as ideas for years, like how could we do angled parking? Well, you really can't. Can we do this? You know, why are there so many issues with the trees? Um, so we did a lot of research. There was a lot of interviews with the business community, property owners, um, even city staff, met with the police chief, met with community services. Um, and that led to all the community engagement, who's really wanted to go out to the community, also having had been informed with a little bit of information. So the community engagement process um, spanned a few months, and then finally the streetscape plan preparation took the final few months. 
So community and city engagement sessions is really important to the plan, and I know many of you participated as well as many community members in the audience tonight, and I think one thing you might remember was our walk shop. Um, and we also did an exercise, as you see here, with you know, put, little children putting little dots on what they liked around the downtown. So we were able to get a lot of great input, and we also had the online survey, which got almost 100 responses. So we were able here to do sort of, um, creative engagement ideas. Um, I think the walk shop was very successful because as we walked that block of the the blocks of the downtown, we got really great input. Walked into businesses, talked to them about what works and doesn't work. Um, the the community drop in event was on a Saturday afternoon, so we really sort of got that captive family audience that comes to the downtown. Um, and I want to emphasize we because this is such a broad plan, we talked to a lot of city commission and committees. Um, we visited culture and arts, parks and recreation and the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee. We got a lot of good feedback there. And you'll hear about that tonight from the consultant as to how that feedback really drove some of the critical decisions and items that you see, see tonight. Um, and I want to emphasize, we really also got a lot of input from the business community. We reached out to them um, and we were able to meet with some of them and got really good input. So the Planning Commission reviewed this. They're an advisory review body, so they're not forwarding, um, for example, a resolution for you, but they did have two meetings, one in May. Um, the May meeting was just to review some conceptual ideas, so not the full plan that you see now, but um, they gave us some really good input on the conceptual design, such as adding more trees. Well, it'd be great to do. And also there's other opportunities for just plantings, such as green infrastructure plantings. Um, signage, really important. But they also sort of delved into what's the land use character of the downtown. Again, we talk about what is the city, city's vision for this street? Well, we know it's a downtown, but that means there's businesses there and what businesses do we really want? Um, so the Planning Commission has had an interest in looking at issues around the downtown, property maintenance, um, land uses, parking requirements, and we will hopefully be working through that next year. Um, but there was support for really sort of supporting that for family oriented character and kind of the destination character through making sure we have really good signage so you can find the parking through the Paseos, good lighting, good pedestrian amenities, bike racks, for example. Things that are really important when you're catering to a wide audience, right? This is a street really from zero to 100. So you have to accommodate babies and, you know, um, a, wide, a wide audience. So that was touched upon. Um, installation of art. I think what you'll see in the plan is kind of theme of, of sort of being artistic and whimsical. And so that was supported by the Planning Commission. They gave us some good direction on that. So in closing, that final review by the Planning Commission was at their last meeting in August. And they had the same plan before you tonight. Um, they provided input and, and even broadened their horizons. So there's a lot of talk about Centennial Plaza. What should that be? What should we have there? Um, any changes to that because the city park would obviously come through with a really detailed process such as for Florida Park and go through Parks and Rec Commission too. Um, but they had comments on that. There was again this talk about art and aesthetics and how you express that. There was a preference to, for warmer materials, more color, which you'll see tonight from the consultant's presentations. We have asked them to, to take another look at that palette and you'll see some, um, some ideas tonight that could be incorporated. Lighting, again, really, really important. Um, also, there was talk about what's the branding of the street, and this would be a separate kind of effort, economic development effort, but there was talk about, you know, how do we incorporate the city with a heart, and what's our logo, and um, so that's a separate effort, but it was something that they talk about. Um, also, this has come before, especially with the TSPC and the Downtown Parking Management Plan, has given me really good pickup and drop off and street loading zones. So again, a separate work item is on our horizon and it is addressed, um, touched upon this plan. So as you can see, this very, covers a lot of topics. Um, Planning Commission made some comments and what we wanted to do was incorporate any their comments that we can address in the final plan. So that would be coming back in the final plan. So in closing, I just want to emphasize the outcome. We really were trying to achieve with this plan, and this came out of the community input process. So um, it's the community's vision, really, is to have this simple and, elegant, simple and elegant street, have these activated paseos, public spaces. You know, we really are blessed with Centennial Plaza in the middle, Posey Park on the north side, and, and those areas could dramatically be changed through improvements. Um, 
and we also want to have better street trees. I mean, there's a lot of beautiful downtowns that are really anchored through amazing street trees um, and enhanced pedestrian safety. And more importantly, just a unique identity. So it's the closing term here. It's just a really unique identity. And we think, yeah, that's the downtown that, that I can imagine. And um, what that does is just draws in people and it, it really spurs economic investment. All of the really successful downtowns have done this, many of them, you know, years ago. Um, I think it is a priority to the city too. So I just wanna emphasize, I know that there's a significant dollar amount, but we are identifying and always looking for creative ways to finance that either through private development, through grants, um, through our development impact fee funding. But we know it's an expensive plan, but we are you know, committed to looking at ways to finance this. So now I'll turn it over to Jacob Tobias who is with the firm Walsh, Robert and Todd. He's a senior landscape architect um, and he's been on this since the beginning and is really, really committed to articulating the community's vision for this, this plan. So thank you. Thank you, Darcy. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, I'm very pleased to be here again. Uh, I have, if you've seen me present about this, you're, you're gonna hear a few things um, that I've said before, but the main one that I like to say every time I come is how much I like it here. Uh, we at our office had honestly not spent any time on San Mateo Avenue before we, uh, we were chosen for this project, and we fell in love with it. One of the things I love about my job is I get to go to lots of different communities. Um, some of them we look at and we say, boy, these people need our help. Others, we think, God, there's a gem here. There's something really wonderful happening here. How can we make it a little bit better? From our point of view, this street is the latter. This is a real gem in the Bay Area. Uh, one of the things we recognize right away is in the Bay Area where diversity of culture and ethnicity and food and art, where that can kind of be taken for granted, this is, this street is one of the most diverse and most interesting streets in the Bay Area, in my opinion. So I think that um, uh, what we heard on the walk shop and in community uh, meetings and so on is that people in the community tend to focus on the negative and that's only natural. That's how we are as human beings. Sometimes it takes a little outside perspective to remind ourselves of the positive. So um, I, I really like to start talking about this street in that way. Um, Darcy mentioned already the um, extensive outreach we did with the community, with um, various commissions, stakeholder groups. I won't go into detail, um, but this is at least the tenth opportunity for input on this plan, and I commend the city in embarking on such a robust process. We really feel that this plan is an expression of this community's unique needs and unique vision. Um, that's one thing that we always try to do with our work. Every single project of ours looks different because every community is unique. Um, very quickly, the goals established for this project through that community process were activation um, people really want activity out on the street. They want sidewalk seating. They want places to sit. They want places to play for their children. They want 24 hour, well not, maybe not 24 hour, but into the night. That was something we heard a lot. Um, the second one is greening. Um, I, if I can state my personal opinion, and I think I got a lot of nods when I say this, if this project plants trees in the ground, nice big trees in the ground, it will be a success. Uh, if only it does that, and it'll do a lot more than that. Um, in addition to the trees, there's a lot of opportunity here for stormwater management and other types of planting, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little while. Beautification, really expressing uh, art and culture and a sense of craft and a sense of care I think that's something, that is one thing that people really want to see more of on the street, and understandably so. 
safety. So that's lighting, but also um, crosswalks and, and bulb outs and those types of things for pedestrians. Wayfinding. How do you get here from elsewhere? If you're from out of town and you just got off the freeway, how do you know where downtown is? But then also within the street itself, how do you find parking? That's a huge, huge one. So uh, those were two priorities in wayfinding. And then just identity. What, and this is really important, uh, and it came out of our process. This wasn't obvious to us as consultants when we came here. We really needed to tease the, the vision of the community's identity out from your community. Um, there's what in this plan what we call a baseline set of furnishings and improvements. I would describe those as, as sort of the, the bare minimum set of things that uh, would, would create a successful project. They kind of tie everything together also. And then there's a series of special places um, that I'll talk about more uh, in more detail. There's a series of special places that have unique features. And so again, the baseline furnishings are kind of the, the standard items. I'll talk about those in a little while, but just to give an overview. And then these, these unique and artistic elements that would be applied to special places. One of the challenges of this street is finding the right balance between that um, elegant, simple, clear design that Darcy mentioned that was very important to the community and then also that sense of unique character, special things. I think, as I mentioned, the street is very diverse, ethnically, culturally, in terms of what you can do, what you can buy, the types of shops. It's also architecturally diverse. It's quite eclectic. It's already got a lot going on. So in terms of this baseline, the idea is that we want something that ties it all together in a very clear, clean, simple, elegant way. And we don't want to necessarily overdo the fancy things, the art elements, the, the things that will, will add to the eclecticism of the street. So we're really looking for that balance. And I think it's just important to keep that in mind as, as we go through the uh, presentation. Um, just a, an overview. This is a little bit hard to see, but this is the entire project from, from one end to the other, from El Camino Real up to, um, to Posey Park. I just want to mention the main elements. Um, new sidewalks would be provided, clearly a need out there. Trees and planting, as I mentioned. Lighting, uh, we, uh, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, standard street furnishings, and then some special things. So gateways and wayfinding elements and these special places, the paseos, and that word was new to a number of people there, the alleys that lead from the sidewalk to the parking, uh, surface parking behind the buildings, we're calling those paseos. Um, Centennial Park and Posey Park, those are, those are three of the special places. So because greening, as I mentioned, is so important, I'll start with street trees. You can see in the plan the addition of many, many more trees than are out there. The um, removal of the pots that are there now um, and planting trees in the ground. And then another aspect of this is, is using those existing mid-block bulb outs to create places where trees can get even a little bit bigger than uh, in a typical uh, tree pit. And also importantly, balancing the greening with the seating areas and the, si and the active use spaces on the sidewalk. So those, where those bulb outs are, you can plant a tree a little bit farther from the building and provide more space for um, people to sit at cafe tables and, and such. So that's what the, the section diagram there on the right is representing. Um, the trees would be large shade trees. Um, they would grow taller than the building signage. So this is often a concern. Um, and what we highly recommend and have found to be the case is that counterintuitively, the bigger the tree, the better it is for visibility of signage. We know how important that is to merchants. Um, 
In addition to the trees, there's a lot of opportunity for other types of planting and stormwater management. So the, um, we did have a conversation with the team that produced the green infrastructure plan, which I understand you approved recently. This street has a lot of opportunities to manage stormwater. Um, the uh, Genvian intersection um, has a storm drain inlet right there and a, a pretty big opportunity to create um, a real green moment that happens to be directly adjacent to Centennial Park, which I'll talk about in a minute. So this can really be a central feature. And then all of the existing bulb outs, both at the corners and mid block, um, would be an opportunity both for just green um, to provide all the benefits of green, but also potentially stormwater uh, infiltration types of planting. Again, to reiterate the point about the character, that sense of the, the simple, clean, elegant baseline, and then uh, focused areas where you could have artistic elements. We talked, as Darcy mentioned, to the Arts Commission, and then also a lot of the stakeholders. Um, we're, we're pretty excited about um, special paving in certain areas, artistic crosswalks, artistic seating, and then the lighting is a whole um, opportunity to do something special. So segueing into lighting, you can see on these two plans, the top plan, that l narrow strip there, is the existing light fixtures. The next one down is the proposed. We did a uh, lighting analysis. We had our civil engineer go out there with light meters, and they did confirm what everybody said, which is it's just too dark out there. Um, So just adding a lot more street lights will go a long way. And then in, in addition to that, of course, as I just mentioned, the artistic opportunities for additional lighting. Um, the Planning Commission had a lot of interest in providing a um, sort of a, a sense of flow with lights. And so that's why we're proposing that there might be a consistent lighting element uh, with benches and the seat walls that as you look down the street, you'd see this um, special lighting hitting the ground plane as well as coming from above. And then uh, seasonal lighting, providing opportunities for those. One of the, the, that is just that, that did influence our selection of a tree. It's a, it's a deciduous tree with an open branching structure. And then the paseos really need lighting and the importance of those paseos I'll talk about in a minute. I'll talk about it right now. Uh, the paseos are very critical, a very con critical component of this, not only because they're an opportunity for something special, and this was really um, reiterated again and again, that the idea of having some art in the paseos, it could be implemented through a competition or by commissioning artists. Um, these little moments of literally light and color and art uh, as they punctuate the street will add a lot of character. But more importantly than that, or at least as important, the, uh, the function of these paseos as a solution to what many people described as a parking uh, scarcity out there. Um, you approved the parking management plan probably a couple of months ago now. Um, it identifies that Yes, the parking does get pretty full at peak hours. It never gets to complete capacity. Um, this plan follows that plan, the parking management plan's recommendations, which are primarily to um, increase the use of these surface lots that are off the street. So the paseos become a really important aspect of that. Posey Park, um, it was Definitely no, no, nobody was shy about saying uh, that Posey Park does not, uh, does not represent a success right now. Uh, the fountains haven't been working. Um, the way the park is designed seems to make it easy for, for, for people that not everybody feels comfortable hanging out with. They hang out in this park. I'm trying to put that in, a, in as polite a way as possible. Um, so the plan here is to really create um, a, a green gateway. You know, I was actually looking at some, I think it was some Google Street Views from, from before the time of the Caltrain overpass, 
And it was only recently that I realized you actually had that at one time, not long ago. Some big redwood trees right there. Um, so the, the concept is to bring that back. Large trees, lots of shade. And then functionally to really move the functional spaces, the usable spaces out towards the street, create fewer places to hide, um, make it a, a real usable park that would support um, additional uh, residents that will be coming into the area and also support uh, and provide amenities for people going to the Caltrain station. And then finally, in terms of these sort of special places, uh, it was repeated time and time again that the community feels that Centennial Park is a missed opportunity. Um, the, uh, the possibility of having um, uh, entertainment there, uh, lunchtime concerts or weekend concerts, outdoor uh, dance activities, all of that. And then one idea that came out of the community process that we actually hadn't really thought of on our own was um, children's play. It's just a great opportunity. The street has this sort of constellation of children's oriented uh, uses like the swim school and other things like that right in that area. So that was added to the, to the list. And we, we, we didn't get deep into the design of this, but we provided some conceptual programming diagrams for how that might all lay out. The importance of wayfinding, I mentioned, mostly about getting people to this street from outside of the street, and then when you're on the street, um, getting them to parking, and then uh, getting them from those parking lots as pedestrians back onto the street. It can be a little disorienting once you get into the parking lots. And then one other element that may be implemented um, would be uh, uh, directories that help people identify what um, stores and shops are there along the street. And then finally, um, these gateways. This was something that the community was very much in favor of. And through the process, they identified the style and the size and, and locations of these gateways. We have a few concepts here um, that would require more development. Uh, important to note that they should be part of the nighttime environment as well as the daytime environment. And then, um, the, our, our scope included doing cost estimates for all of this stuff. And everything I just mentioned um, may be more than, one, than the city can implement at once. And so we also prioritized these items uh, into four tiers. So tier one is represented at the top of the slide here with those images. It really is that baseline uh, project. Again, I think it's important to recognize that um, the, the price tag here is, is very much within the, the realm of what we see implemented uh, very frequently on similar projects. 6.3 million is, is very reasonable, and what you would get here for that, even the, the bare minimum of this project, it would be a huge success. The most important things, the greening, simply replacing the sidewalks, new furnishings, and lighting, and the signage. Really important at elements. And then the next tier brings us just under $10 million. That was a number that's been mentioned um, as a reasonable amount that could be raised and through different means. Um, and here I think we add very important elements. The paseos, which are the most important of the special places because of their function in terms of the parking, um, that greening at Genevian, um, the gateways, and the greening at the bulbouts. I think that if you did a project for just under 10 million, this would be a smashing success. And then the second two tiers, or the, the last two tiers, three and four, incorporate other elements um, that I would describe as sort of the icing on the cake. A, a number of artistic elements. Um, and then I think most importantly here, oh, and also a number of extra greening uh, sustainable elements uh, related to stormwater management. And then I think the two biggest items here would be Posey Park and Centennial Park, which I would um, 
you know, that, that sort of a little bit outside of, of the scope of a typical streetscape. You're actually adding two public parks to the project. So these would be nice to have, but again, I think um, the, the sort of 10 million uh, uh, target would get you an, a very nice streetscape. Since Darcy mentioned it as one of the important uh, inputs of the um, Planning Commission, there was maybe some concern that the, the palette, the color, was a little bit, um, uh, I don't know the right word. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna say cold, because I actually think it would be quite nice, frankly, and that's why we're proposing it. That stainless steel palette is very modern, but there was the desire to explore something a little bit warmer. I, uh, I just would, would if, if that is something that's explored, and as a conceptual plan, it's very much in the, in the possibility still not to nail this down, um, I would just reiterate that it should be consistent. We don't want to add to the cacophony out there, right? So there wants to be this elegance, but you could easily imagine a slightly warmer tone for those elements. And then the artistic elements, um, I think they need to be selected with care and with an eye to the big picture. Um, but so this last slide suggests that crosswalks could be full of color. The special paving could have color in it, um, et cetera. So it, it, the, the range of possibilities within those uh, unique and art artistic expression elements um, we don't want to narrow that too much right now in this plan, and I don't think we wanted to imply that that would be narrowed down. I do think that it needs to be considered as a as a whole, so that there's um, there's some sense of consistency, some repeated themes, things like that. Um, but that was one comment. The other the other place where we did include in the plan some other alternatives was the signage, which could be another opportunity to bring in a little bit more color. Um, so since Darcy mentioned that as, as important input from the Planning Commission, we thought we'd bring those to your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jacob. So that concludes the staff and consultant presentations for tonight. And both myself and the consultant are happy to answer any questions you have. I can accept public comment if there is any and proceed with getting your comments. Sure, thank you. Uh, anybody want to speak <laughs> on Val? All right, why don't we bring it back to council and uh, questions, comments? Michael. Yeah, sure. Please. So I, 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 I've been looking through the report and I see how important the trees are and, and I heard the consultant tell us how important the trees are. But I know that the trees also have a very big price tag when it comes to maintenance and they tend to damage sidewalks, they have to be trimmed, they um, get overgrown and block the street lights create, creating shadows and then people end up tripping and uh, so we've had those issues to deal with. So a question I would have is, are there any successful streetscape projects out there that don't involve a lot of trees? And um, if not, if the trees are a, a requirement, then um, are we uh, factoring in what our ongoing maintenance costs are gonna be if we decide to go that route of, of placing all of these trees? I am hard pressed to um, think of uh, streetscapes that don't have trees that I would consider successful. That's a good question. I'm, I imagine there are ones out there. Um, we, uh, we do need to address that in cases where there's enough underground utilities, conflicts and things like that where it becomes an issue and you can mitigate for, uh, you know, the, Impo you know, in some cases it's impossible to plant trees, and I have seen some streets that have other types of shade structures and things like that. Um, so that is something that can be studied. But I would say that there's a couple of answers about just the, the maintenance of trees and, and selecting the right tree, but also planting it in the right way. 
Um, and we were, we did consider that carefully in this plan. Um, in terms of sidewalk damage, one of the main most important things is to give that tree a big enough tree well. So most of the damage to sidewalks happens actually quite close to the, the, the trunk of the tree. It's called the root flare zone, and those are where the big roots start to grow. But pretty quickly after you get outside of a few feet of the tree trunk itself, the roots get much smaller. And so just providing a big enough space is a huge, uh, uh, you know, it's sort of 90% of the problem. The other would be selecting the right kind of tree. And the tree that we're recommending is a tried and true urban street tree. Um, we can find many examples of this particular species doing really well in this kind of environment at full maturity. A um, couple of other thoughts is that we did select a uh, deciduous tree, which counterintuitively you think it's going to drop all its leaves and become a problem. But the reality is that an evergreen tree drops leaves constantly year round, and you're constantly dealing with the leaves whereas a deciduous tree actually ha is easier to maintain from that point of view. Um, so those are just some thoughts about the trees. Uh, it is, you know, there is a cost to them, but I think um, the value just outweighs the cost. And there are studies about that, about the value. You know, people have tried to put dollar signs to the value of trees and, and in terms of how much you get for how much you, you spend on trees, it's, it's generally considered worth it. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be you know, our standard response about, about street trees. Uh, they are spaced in this plan at 40 feet apart, which is pretty wide actually. So in terms of blocking lights and getting too dense, uh, we think we actually were pretty conservative in that regard. Okay. So. Okay. And, and I noticed that the, the report did mention the fact that we have uh, storm sewers running underneath one of the sidewalks. That's why we have to use those pots that we have out there now and uh, right. potentially could continue to be a problem with, with newer trees as well. We um, did, um, if I may, we did do a very thorough analysis of the utilities and we did identify one location where um, we need to do some more investigation of the depth of this. There's a very large storm culvert under the, mm -hmm. the northern end of the street. And so depending on how deep that is, that could become an issue. Uh, but we don't know actually how deep it is. Um, and there is one place where uh, we're recommending moving a water line. But the city already did replace the entire water line. And that, my understanding is that that removed the problem that was that was that was uh, preventing you from right. planting trees a long time ago. Everything so you're, you've got it all. You, you're in good. You know that you've gotten a, a long way towards making this plan implementable. We mm -hmm. we've have other projects where the utilities are a much bigger problem. So you're lucky, <laughs> or maybe it was not luck. Maybe it was good planning. Okay. So. And and one uh, one last question. If parking was not a consideration, say we had plenty of parking not on San Mateo Avenue, would this design, could this design be dramatically different? Could we do something better, more elaborate, more stunning if we didn't have to accommodate cars on that street? Mm. That's a good question. I think that um, despite the fact that as a landscape architect and, and you know, my, my office is full of landscape architects who love green and trees and wider sidewalks. We're actually very cautious about the notion of removing parking from any commercial corridor. Um, even if you had parking elsewhere, the parking here provides a couple of assets. One is it does support the business. It does give people reason to drive up and down the street um, and the other is it actually provides a buffer between the sidewalk and the street itself. Um, we would just have to study it carefully. It would be, it would be uh, there could be great benefit to removing parking as well. Um, or you could split the middle, split the difference, and, and put more mid-block bulb outs and more trees in that way. That might be a really nice thing to do. Mm -hmm. But we heard very clearly that parking is... It is very precious. <laughs> so, right. if you built a parking garage, that would be an interest. It would be it would be worth looking at what more we could do. Right. Um, 
The other thing you could do is put bike lanes in. And currently with the width of the street, you can't fit bike lanes and have the parking. So right. that would be another interesting trade-off. Right. Yeah, we're definitely in a, what, what appears to be some sort of a, a transition where we're looking to the future, and that future, by all indications, it seems to be a future that has far fewer cars. So if we're, you know, as, as we design these things, and this is definitely a few years out, um, yeah, I'm just, you know, thinking, you know, is, is parking going to be that important on that street if we have, say, a parking structure where we could accommodate more cars? Could we take them off there and do something nicer uh, on this street? But um, thank you for your comments. Thank you. Can I just provide a little bit more? Please information so I think we felt like with this plan we would just hold the curb line and and so because we have great sidewalk widths now we we had some comments to narrow the sidewalks and you know maybe that would accommodate the angled parking that people and then add more parking and we just felt like hold the curb line because it's a good curb now we have a good street but to answer your question in the full long range you know if there was less demand for street parking possibly you could add for example bike lanes or um, bike parking or parklets. There was also a, questions about parklets. You know, those are like they take the parking in the street and they make a little outdoor eating space or something. So I think all of those could be accommodated, but a real clear goal here was just hold the curb line and then, you know, like a bike lane and parking is basically just striping. So we would have those options down the line. Okay. Also right. saves a lot of money to hold the curb line. So if you do kind of what Burlingham Avenue did, move the whole curb line out and get rid of the parallel, the angled parking at parallel parking, that's a millions of dollars more. So I want to emphasize we did make some some decisions that, to minimize overall cost. But certainly long, long term, we, we have options. And, you know, there's automated cars, cars, lots of options down the line that would allow for flexibility. Okay. And, and so since you brought that up, the, the costs that are uh, outlined in the report that show sidewalk replacement, that assumes it would be we're only replacing some, something very similar to what's in place right now. And, um... Well, in terms of the location, yes. There would be additive paving for bulb outs. Mm -hmm. um, so that would add some cost to add that extra paving. But in some areas, you're adding the greening to less, you know, moving paving, adding greening. But the curb line would be held. Okay. And again, as, as um, Jacob mentioned, the utility cost would have added also a lot to the cost of the project. In Burlingame, that utility, that downtown project was like half utility costs overall. Different source of funding, right? Um, but still added a huge amount of cost and also construction time, right? So massive construction undertaking. So we're kind of blessed here that we said we were able to keep the curb line where it was um, and and really just, we have the width that we think is reasonable now. Okay, thank you. Laura? Mike. So I have a lot of history with San Mateo Avenue. Um, my father had a business for over 35 years, and I wanna say probably about 35 years ago, San Bruno actually remodeled the downtown area and got rid of the uh, diagonal parking. Um, and we were fighters against all that because as a business owner, you need parking to survive. And if a resident can't drive up and find parking on the street or a parking lot, they're gonna move on and they're gonna move on to Bay Hill or Tam Fran, which is kind of what hurt a lot of businesses on San Mateo Avenue. Um, in addition, they came back with um, a lot of these big cement um, benches, trees. Um, they blocked views, they took parking away. Um, and the city eventually came back and removed some of those and actually added some more parking spaces back. So I appreciate your comments about parking. It, you know, parking is a gem. And Michael, I don't know if in 20 years or 10 years it will see a decline in parking. I mean, I think people will still want to drive down to the store because unfortunately when you live in Rollingwood or you live up in Crestmore Park, you still got to drive down to San Mateo Avenue. Um, there'll always kind of be cars. Um, clearly, we don't have enough parking on the street, um, but I, I love the design. I love the signage. I think all that's kind of beautiful. Um, so I kind of want to go through some things that, that, you know, just sort of in summary and sort of the notes that I've kind of taken as going through the, the report. Yeah, poor lighting. You know, I definitely love your recommendation on increasing the lighting. I think that's way important. Um, yeah, the sidewalks are pretty poor, and so we need to, we have a lot of uneven pavement, and um, 
So that's an important, um, yeah, the unsightly garbage can. So being able to replace garbage cans. Um, I was walking down the street just last week and the door to the garbage can wouldn't even close. So the garbage can sticking out. I mean, it's disgustingly dirty. It's, I tried to kick it in, it wouldn't move. So I just kind of left it there, but it looked, it was pretty, pretty bad. Um, definitely not maintained. So the comment, Michael, that you had about the, the trees and the shrubs, we're not maintaining our current shrubs. So that would have to definitely be something that we put into place. Um, but I will say, and there's not a street that I've been down that I will say is beautiful, that you don't look back and see trees. Um, you know, when you stand at one end of San Mateo Avenue and you look back, it's pretty boring. Um, it really lacks the trees. There's some bigger trees in some areas, and then there's sections of really no trees at all. Um, I, I, we definitely need to add the trees. We need to add the greenery. I think it's really important. Um, it sounded like in the report there were some code compliance shortcomings with entrances, some sloped issues, and so I hope we get that addressed. Um, I don't know what 2% of a sloped issue is a big deal, but it doesn't sound as big, but it probably is something that could be addressed. Um, bus stops not providing adequate accessibilities for riders with disabilities. I mean, that's a big deal. We've got to address that. I mean, I'm surprised we haven't addressed it to date, but you know, it all comes down to funding. So I'm glad that's, that's going to be addressed. Um, bike lanes, yeah, there's definitely no, no, no space for the bike lanes, but there's something we could do. I mean, just adding bike racks so somebody could lock up a bike in certain areas and then walk. Um, I know one of the things they did on San Mateo Avenue too, which is really kind of a bummer for the 400 block of San Mateo Avenue was, they made it um, a right turn only. It used to be that you can you can come down Genevin. Um, so there's a beautiful picture of the corner of San Mateo Avenue with the Bank of America. So if I'm at that corner on Genevin and I make a right turn to go down toward the 400 block, toward the 406, which is a new, you can only make a right turn and U-turn. So what it did is it actually really changed the traffic flow on that 400 block. You really lose traffic flow. Um, if you look at the traffic flow from the opposite end, let's say from Artichoke Joe's, there's a ton of traffic and then they just make that right turn to Genevin and head out to San Bernardino Avenue and they don't go down to the 400 block. As a business owner, that's, you suffer because you open up a storefront and you don't know it exists. Um, but I know for safety purposes, I don't know that that, that can ever be fixed. If there is something that we could do to make that better down the road, I, I would like to see something be done with that because I know how much that actually damaged our business. Um, yeah, limited greenery. I mean, like, trees are just one thing, but there's really can be some beautiful greenery and flowers that we can maintain in bushes. Um, really, again, I just want to state how much I'm not willing to lose parking. Um, I also noticed at Posey Park, um, it just so happened to be that one day when I was there, there was a, a mother and her daughter, and they both had strollers because I think they had twins, and they were pushing the kids in the strollers. Um, and they took the ramp up to the Caltrans station at Posey Park. And then there was somebody else with disabilities and they were kind of getting dropped off to go up to the thing. So I just felt that that Posey Park, and I appreciate the feedback with bringing the benches toward the front of the street so they're not actually hidden back there, sleeping on bench chairs. Um, I don't know, maybe they're sleeping into the fountain that doesn't exist. Um, but is there something we can do with drop off? Um, or is there another drop off location? I would assume in the parking lot and you can catch an elevator. I don't even know, cause I don't take that. but. Is there something we can do with some sort of disability drop-off um, at the Posey Park? Because it's really kind of a big space, and that big space is going to cost us a lot of money. Um, Centennial Plaza, I, I know, yeah, I don't really know what the thought was because I wasn't on the council years ago with the purchase of the Wells Fargo, and then to tear that down and to leave sort of some greenery, some sort of park that you can't walk through. And I know that there's been some footing left on that in Centennial Plaza. But is there, um, I mean, it goes back to parking. So is Centennial Plaza an important thing um, or is it also an entrance to a garage that's something for the future? So I, I, I kind of, you know, I want to beautify the downtown, but I worry about doing something that, you know, in 10 years when we do have more funding to bring in a garage and that could be the entrance to that garage. Um, and we've put all this money into Centennial Park. So I, I, I get concerned about that. Um, I guess the big thing is, you know, you hear this all the time and we've all heard this, you know, what is, when, when is city council going to do something about San Mateo Avenue? You know, we talk about it, we talk about it, we talk about it. So I, I really appreciate the sort of phased approach. Um, I love the signage that goes over the downtown area where it, you see this 
San Bruno that goes across San Mateo Avenue. Of the two designs, I like the one that goes directly over San, San Mateo Avenue. I think that's just beautiful. I think we've been missing something like that. If you come off of 101 and you come down San Bruno Avenue, there was going to be an archway that was sort of a welcome to San Bruno, but we, we lost out on that um, because of funding. And it doesn't really tell you about the downtown. It doesn't really catch you that you need to make a left turn to go to the downtown area. So it's just something that's catchy. Um, and then, you, you know, you kind of get welcome into this downtown San Mateo Avenue. I think that's beautiful. Um, so I'd really like to see something like that. Um, I, I will say, and I, and I appreciate your comments too in the beginning, is that it really is a little gem. As much as we talk about all the negative stuff about, you know, San Mateo Avenue and what it doesn't have, um, there are really some nice storefronts and very unique. Everybody's a little bit different. Um, some, a lot of them have been remodeled, and, and you look at it, really, there's, I think there's more nice than there is kind of the ugly stuff. Um, and I think that, that business owners are really kind of doing a lot about trying to keep their storefronts clean. Um, I did notice, um, and I think it's come up before, about garbage receptacles. You know, what do we, what do, we do about that? You know, seeing a, a garbage can roll out in front on San Mateo Avenue with this stuff kind of is, is disgusting. Um, there's even one business that kind of has a little alcove and it's got the garbage cans and so you kind of walk by and it's like, can't they just put a, a door in front of that so we don't actually have to see and smell the ugliness uh, of that? Um, so what's the plan for, for that on, on those businesses? Because um, I think that's an important thing. And then the other thing I noticed is that, um, God, unloading on San Mateo Avenue, right? That the, biz, the trucks, big trucks, can just park on San Mateo Avenue and go into their business and, and unload. And, and we actually watched somebody for a good 45 minutes who was parked on San Mateo Avenue just unloading his truck, 45 minutes. And I gotta tell you, it was a busy time of day. There was a lot of cars coming, coming down um, in both directions, San Mateo Avenue, but a truck was parked for 45 minutes on San Mateo Avenue. So I've heard a little bit about, hey, La Petite Baleine, there's parents dropping off their kids, we should have an unloading zone. Well, La Petite Baleine was here today, years ago it was a hardware store, so what's it gonna be tomorrow? We can't create a specific unloading zone for La Petite Baleine, and they've got a parking lot in back, but there kinda needs to be some of that um, where we could move vehicles um, off of San Mateo Avenue and block in that flow of traffic. Um, but I think it comes with signage directing them to a place um, where that could be. And maybe some of those side streets where they can drop off there instead of the San Mateo Avenue. Um, but great designs, great, uh, good feedback, even good feedback by the commission, um, planning commission. And um, I, I look forward, I think this is, uh, it's, I look forward to getting the funding from new development to hopefully we can eventually pay for some of the stuff to beautify San Mateo Avenue. So thank you. Uh, I'll echo some of what I've heard, um, but also going to the Centennial uh, Park. So my memory is telling me that we uh, purchased that with redevelopment funds. And if we in fact did do that, then I think that there may be some where you just can't, it has to be open space or it has to be something that may be restricted to what we can do with it or can't. But at the same time too, Back when that was done, it was supposed to be temporary. That was a something then other than the chain link fence that was there to, that had weeds and newspaper and trash. And so that was a temporary fix that staff came up with, with council support uh, and did everything within house. But if we're gonna start doing something with that, then we should be thinking about long-term. Um, it's called a park which has been delegated as a park, but in essence, you can't get into it. It's very roped off. We hear that from the community quite a bit as far as uh, making some modifications or improvements. You know, also with the lighting, uh, we under did the street light some time ago, and what it was was, A, a the wind uh, is very strong down that certain corridors, and so we actually try to light. Uh, for a period of time, it was supposed to increase the light visibility as well as the durability. So again, I always get leery when I hear about, now we need a new one and you know it's going to make improvements because what we had had prior, um, they weren't holding up and it, it wasn't um, good as far as that's concerned. The garbage cans, the sidewalks, I mean, we've all talked about that, the trees. Uh, I think they don't like, the p folks don't like the pots per se. Um, I do think that uh, bike lanes and or bike racks, it, it's kind of due and 
kind of a concern with that interaction that we have between the bikes, the pedestrians, and uh, the vehicles. The phased approach, we almost have to go into that path, I think. Um, the unloading that Laura brought up, I mean, we all know that it's it's gone on for some, some time, but it seems to be getting worse, and it seems to be just the fact that um, it's not just a quick drop. I mean, somebody will literally just wait and with their hazards on, um, both for pedestrian use as well as for uh, merchant. Um, but I also thought with the lighting that there was going to be something that um, businesses, when they would go in there, that the awning would be lit outside, that there was some stipulation that when you had new businesses that would go in, that that would be what would help the security, it helped the uh, perception for people walking there and there weren't real dark spots all the way throughout with awnings. I, I think that uh, the Posey Park does need help. Um, and. and you know, it's newer and what have you, but I think that mound, obviously, in retrospect, wasn't well placed. And I think we've got to figure out about the fountain, the arch, all those little things that folks are looking for. Because um, when the last time I think the ad was done, I forgot the year you just mentioned how many years ago, but I mean, that was supposed to be the big, the big change. But really what it did is it reduced parking. Um, it had items that, you know, were good, great, and then not. We have that sign that's there, that um, the the marquee board, that obviously is kind of seen its days, and it's uh, half of the size it was because of the top part was kind of deteriorating, to be honest. So um, I also think I'd like to have something that's acknowledged, and I I like the downtown San Bruno across uh, the entire street is as well. I think that that just looks more aesthetically pleasing. So uh, I think this is something that the community wants. Laura and Michael both know they've been in town long, long enough that we always are. When are we? Even if it's garbage cans, even if it's something, some steps and some phases. Uh, but again, of course, it's funding. So um, I'm excited, but at the same time, I want to be realistic to the community and what the expectations are and, and how long this project may really take. So um, I don't know if staff needs further comments or clarification from us. No, that is excellent feedback. Thank you so much. Laura, please. To the chair, by the way, I did like the comment um, that the vision should be simple, elegant, and unique. So that was good too. Mm -hmm. I think all three of us are concurring with that uh, statement. Anything else you wanna add? Okay. Um, if you have uh, everything that you need, we'll go ahead and uh, have uh, Marty come back and we'll move on to comments from council members. Michael, anything? Yeah. Laura? Thank you. Thank you for staying uh, with us this evening and for your report. And um, we're on council comments, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so today, um, actually, Saturday is the uh, breakfast at American Legion, 8.30 to 11 o'clock. Um, I'll be there early, but then I have to go to a Peninsula Clean Energy retreat. So um, that's it. Um, I was going to say that uh, some of us were at today a uh, ribbon cutting that was up at uh, Skyline College, and I will tell you um, to say this building was coming today and to mark it on your calendars and actually to be up there in Building 12 and to see the architect, the design, and the the what it looks out to, and again, today was a perfect day for them to have that, uh, was just impressive and uh, amazing and beautiful. So um, kudos to it being in our backyard, and uh, it is able to be used by the community as well. So I also wanted just to bring up for future for budgetary is that when I attended a commute.org meeting, you know, we were talking about AB uh, 1912, and then it's about when we have JPAs and if we have a, if they dissolve. 
that who takes the ownership and the liability for the PERS uh, requirement. In commute.org, there's a very small staff. It's, it's um, uh, not been in existence very long, but right now there's really no formula to that. And I guess the state hasn't really, PERS is not taking any action or GASB or, or whatever they go through. But it might be something that we as a city need to be cognizant of because we are on JPAs. And should they dissolve and there's no true um, obligation underneath the agreement, then the cities bear the responsibility divided in some fashion. So with that, I guess that's a new change that um, is still unfolding, but that is a, is a risk or liability that we could be having. And um, I also wanted to bring up that on September 17th, uh, Marty and Javon and I attended over at the Board of Supervisors um, meeting, and we were awarded um, out of Measure K from Supervisor Pine and Canapa 150,000 total, 75,000 each um, for the project over at Tom Lara Field and the um, the stands. So that was nice, and thanks to the Lions too for their continued support and. Um, I appreciate that. And then finally, this is coming down, but I attended a strategic action committee meeting. There was about 20 people from stakeholders throughout the county. And what they're doing is they're meeting and giving feedback on strategic planning for the next five years for not only Measure A, but Measure W, which got passed, and how cities and organizations can apply, be sponsors, and then be awarded. So that's something that will be upcoming and uh, will be developed and is in the process of being developed so that that's something that staff and the city, I'll keep you appraised on, but um, those are where the monies are allocated from the Transportation Authority um, for the great separations and other aspects that obviously affect us and our, and our neighbors. So um, that's it for myself. Uh, I want to thank staff uh, for their presence and being here tonight. And we'll go ahead and we'll have an adjournment. The next regular city council meeting will be held on October the 8th here at the Senior Center at 7 o'clock. Meeting adjourned.